hi, <laughs> hello. Um, I realized just as I clicked to go live, I hadn't checked the microphone, which is something I seem to always be doing. So <laughs> welcome to the stream. Um, do let me know if you can hear me because I'm slightly concerned that my microphone is not plugged in and that would be really awkward. So <laughs> um, hopefully it is. Um, hello, hello. Welcome to the last stream of 2023, which is actually really scary, <laughs> actually. Um, I was thinking it, it was like ages away and then all of a sudden it's December and I'm like, oh, oh, okay. So most of you know, if you've been here for a while, I have a problem with time management. So I found a new technique, given the fact that a timer didn't work last time. I am going to light. <laughs> a tea light and we are going to use that as the timer for the stream so I'm doing this now while I'm thinking about it so that then I can use this as my timer because I actually got a really really pretty pretty new thing that I can put my tea lights in so that they don't heat everything up behind it which I think is so smart. Why did I not think of that? I don't, I don't know. Boop. Okay. And then that can go over there. That is my little timer. So, oh, right. Hello, hello, hello. Let's have a look where everyone is from and the witchiest way to measure time. And this is what I'm going to have to go for because clearly timers have not been working for me and I just ignore them. Same with alarms, like I will just like snooze them. So I figured this is the witchiest kind of alarm that I can possibly have. So <laughs> that's what we're going to be using today. So as always on my live streams, they are done chronologically and I try to answer as many questions and chat to as many people as I can. But do bear in mind that the chat moves a lot faster than I do and usually I am considerably behind on my live chats than I should be. So um, I'm going to try and work through as quickly as I can. Please try to avoid spamming questions if you've already posted it then I simply haven't got to it yet, is usually the reason that it hasn't been answered. If I come to a question that I've already done a video on, or I've already answered multiple times in the stream, I may skip over it, but I will probably tell you why I'm skipping over it. And I do not know the answer to every single question. I simply don't. I am not the be all end all of magical knowledge. And so sometimes I simply don't know. And if that's the case, I'm going to tell you there's no point in me bullshitting my way through it. If I don't know an answer, I will tell you that I simply don't know. But hopefully I will be able to direct you to people or sources that might be able to give you more information. Okay, with that being said, let's have a look at where everyone is from. Let's have a look see. And uh, yeah, because I'm always amazed by how far away some people come from. So we've got Switzerland, Idaho, Kent, Pennsylvania, England, Arizona, Houston, San Antonio. Oh, we've got two people from Texas back to back. Where else are we? Dominican Republic, New Orleans, New York. I obviously won't be able to get to every single person's <laughs> um, location because that would be just way too many. North Carolina, Croatia, Germany, Iowa, Ireland, Ohio, Finland, Alabama, Canada. So we've got North Idaho, Fort Worth, Georgia, the Ozarks, Massachusetts. I'm, I'm just literally just reading them out as they're coming in. This is so many. South Africa, Utah, Georgia, Cologne. I think it's spelt Cologne. No, I think it's pronounced Cologne. Maybe? I'm not sure. Berlin, <laughs> Illinois, Colorado, so many people from so many places. Wow, absolutely amazing. It, it absolutely always blows me away how people are from everywhere. Arkansas, Delaware, Dubai, Jamaica, Indiana, Michigan. Wow, so many people. Mongolia, you know what is actually really funny? Not this year, because I haven't posted any podcast episodes this year, but on the year, I think it was like 2020 or 2021 that I posted my podcast season one. It was really high up in the rankings of history podcasts in Mongolia <laughs> and only Mongolia, which I think is just really, really cool. That's, I don't know, maybe that's just me thinking it's interesting, but I thought that was really, really cool. So yeah, so many people from so, so many places. With that being said, um, 
let's start answering some questions. I am gonna go right back up to the top again to try to answer as many. I really apologize if the stream does jump. It does happen quite a lot. So I'm gonna try and answer as many as I can before the stream kind of freaks out. And um, yeah, so, so it's so difficult to deal with, which is why I'm considering switching it up every so often for the live streams, just so that I am not constantly losing track of questions. Okay, right. <laughs> right up at the top, what do we have here? So let's see if we can find the first one. I have one question here that's part two of two, but there isn't a part one. So if you, before the stream, um, Invader Tiff 13, I think it is, um, part one is not there. So I've got part two of the question, but not part one of the question. So sorry about that one. Um, if, if you know what the question was and you want to retype it, feel free to, and I will try and get around to answering it. Where do we have here? Oh, so this, this is one that I often get asked about and it is, hello from San Antonio, Texas. Thoughts on the book Spiral Dance by Starhawk. I'm trying to vet it for mum who wants to learn about goddess worship, but not too Wiccany. So this is actually one that I have never ever read and it's been on my list of books to read for a very long time. This book was recommended to me right at the very, very start of my practice, like when I first started interacting with people online and I still haven't read it. So I'm gonna put this one out to all of you watching. If you have read Star, no, if you have read Spy, whoa, words today. <laughs> if you have read Spiral Dance, by Starhawk, that, I butchered that entirely. Feel free to let me know what your thoughts on it were because I've got some people who absolutely swear by it, who absolutely love it, and I've met some people who really didn't like it and I'd love to know your thoughts. Do you think it would be appropriate to give someone who's interested in learning about this? Let me know and maybe that will influence me to finally pull my finger out and get it because it has been a very, very long time coming. Oh, okay, here we go. So this is the question from the very start that kind of got cut off is, it was about a meditation experience. I prayed to Gaia during it for gratitude and I had a vision of a river and some said it was her saying, you're welcome. This is something that we do see quite a lot in a way is that, um, especially when we're working with deities and we're communing with them, it can be sometimes really difficult to discern whether something is from your own mind, especially in meditations, or whether it is something that is coming from an external source. So it may well be something that you should write down your experiences of, and then if you do the same kind of working again in the future, the same kind of meditation, to see if you get something similar when working with Gaia again. Because if you do, it may well be a connected experience that's gonna link everything up and make it all make sense. Um, it's really difficult from an outside perspective to know whether or not it is something that is coming from yourself or whether it's coming from an external source. It's more commonly about repetition. So if I'm working with Bridget, for instance, who's one of my deities, and I will get the same kind of experience every time I work with her, that kind of cements to me that that is related to her rather than related to me. Whereas if I were to do the same kind of working with Keridwen or with Keranos, I end up with a completely different experience, which to me is what links it all together. This is, this is a question that I've just read. I can't do it yet because it's right at the very bottom. And it just makes me laugh because the, my answer to this is not going to be of any value whatsoever. <laughs> so where were we? Oh, here we go. Hello from Wales. Woo! Wales, I love Wales, sorry. <laughs> I need to go back to Wales again because I absolutely love it. Do you know anything about mediumship or contacting specific beings from beyond the veil? I want to contact my best friend who just passed away, but I'm not sure how I can do that. So when it comes to anything like this, blanket statement for me is gen generally that it's important to wait. And it's important to wait on two fronts. It's kind of a double answer here in that, especially if it's someone that we've really recently lost, it's important that we take the time to properly grieve. Because what I've seen a lot of people do, and it's something that can really trip people up, is that they will constantly be looking for communication. And when they achieve that communication, they do not actually process any of the big heavy feelings that we need to be processing. And then all of a sudden in several months or years, it just kind of hits people like a ton of bricks. And all of that processing that they should have been doing gradually, 
they have to do all in one go several months even years later and that can be really really difficult for, so just make sure that you are undertaking that grieving process to make sure that you're keeping yourself mentally and psychologically kind of sound in all this the other side of that coin is that a lot of the time i recommend leaving spirits a few months even a few years to kind of process and get used to their new existence because it's very, very jarring and often it can be really difficult to figure out what is happening and also how to work that communication back again. So you can try and communicate as many times as you want, but if they haven't got the knack of communicating back again, then you're kind of wasting your time and you're only going to lead to upset and confusion and feeling as though they're not wanting to interact with you when in reality it might be that they simply aren't able to right now so it's important to give everything a little bit of time to settle and to be processed but if then you do decide that you want to communicate little things can be really really good so if you're having a dinner for instance and you have their favorite drink leave a little bit out to them talk out loud to your environment just to kind of let them know that hey we understand each other. Like, I know that you're gone, but this is your favorite drink and I'm still gonna recognize that. Kind of at side point, I'm wearing like pleather trousers and I'm realizing that as I'm sitting on the seat, it's squeaking so loud and I'm not, if you can hear it, I'm so sorry. <laughs> it sounds like a whoopee cushion, but it's not. It's just, it's the jeans on the, the seat and it's very awkward. Okay, the other way of going about it, and it's kind of a step on from that, is to start communicating through sleep. That's a really easy way to get started in that our connection with the spiritual world is less protected when we are asleep. This is why people often have protections around bedrooms, nightmares, some people consider them to be interactions with negative spirits. And when we're in this kind of place, it allows us to more easily connect with other realms and other individuals and spirits and the like. And so you can ask a question during sleep specifically to the person you're looking to reach out to and see what comes back through dreams because you may well find that's an easier way to connect you might find that you will get phantom smells, perhaps of perfume or something that they really enjoyed in their life. And if you do want to take that step even further, you can start working with spirit boards. Now, people have a lot of really negative feelings surrounding spirit boards, but as long as you are keeping yourself safe, you have your own protections and you're using them wisely, they're no more harmful than any other form of divination, especially if it involves communication with spirits. But really drawing them into your space again by communing with them and being open to your experience and that connection with the other person is a really good first step to make sure that then when you do further communication, they are going to be present and they're going to be listening out for that. Now, you don't have to use things like spirit boards. You can use like knocking communication. That's a really common one. So if you know that someone is in your space, then you can start figuring out how they want to communicate. Do they want to come through in dreams? Do they want to come through in divination? Or is it actually noises that they come through in? Is it things that you're experiencing where you ask a question and you get knocks out as an answer? That's a really good way of doing it that avoids the spirit board. If you don't want to work with that, but um, please be sure as mentioned earlier, that everyone is just staying safe in all this, that you are mentally in a good place and that you aren't using it as a substitution for grief processing. Because it's a lot and it's really easy to fall into it as well. And I, I understand that even personally, it's really easy to go, I've just lost someone, I want to communicate with them. I'll do it to make myself feel better. And sometimes that can just make things worse. I feel like I need to, I need to find something else to sit on, <laughs> like, like, <laughs> like um, a blanket or something so I'm not squeaking. Oh my goodness, okay. I did not think this through at all. Is there a protection spell you can suggest for me and my family? So this one is going to entirely depend on whether you want protection just in the home or whether you want protection outside of the home as well. Because that's really gonna change how you're gonna be doing this. So for home protection, you're looking at wards, potentially really long-term wards that you have up all of the time. You might also want items and objects that represent that protective energy and so imbue your space with it. So that might be crystals, that might be herbs, that might be symbols, sigils on doors, windows, other liminal 
well spaces, these kind of things are really, really useful for that. Those are really basic, simple home protections that are for the home and the people who reside within it. If you want protection that's going to expand outside of that, you're going to want to get a little bit more convoluted, perhaps. So this could be protection jewellery, this could be witch bottles, this could be charms that you're carrying around with you, this could be poppets that offer protection. There's honestly a lot out there. I do have a spell, actually, it's in my previous videos, so in my Yule video. I think I'm going to post it separate, that might be coming out next week if I can get it edited in time, honestly, I've been so behind, um, of a protection candle spell. And that is designed to help imbue the space with protection, as well as also the people who are represented in that candle and like the symbols that are carved into it. So it will help with the space, but it will also help with people who are outside of it, which is particularly useful if you do have family members that are like at university or traveling for work and these kind of things, you might want to add additional protection for them into that kind of working. And then that will burn down for honestly a really long time. I'm still burning mine and I did it like a month ago. So I'd say they're gonna last maybe like two or three months depending on how often you burn it and the size of your candle. And then you can then redo that working if you need to. So that's just one example of many, many out there. Okay, where was I? Ooh, here we go. So I know you were drawn to the craft young. What was it like to come out of the broom closet to your family? Were they accepting of it? I don't know is probably the best answer. It was a very strange one because I'd been practicing much longer than I knew I was practicing. That's why when I talk about how long I've been practicing, I say that I've been actively practicing because that's like the point where I was like, oh, <laughs> I'm doing this and I know that I'm doing it instead of I'm doing it and I don't know that I'm doing it. And that was going on for a long time until I started looking into more ceremonial style practice. So like uh, ritual work, uh, circle casting ceremony rather than just energetic circle casting. And I dabbled in having an altar space and kind of figuring that out. And I will always remember the day that I set up my altar for the first time. And um, it was on a card an upturned cardboard box and I had this purple velvet cloth that I put over it I still have the cloth and everything I put on it but I don't know where the cardboard box has gone that's probably gone a long time ago and I had everything laid out on it for a, a wick and circle casting so you had like the two different colored candles you, you know you had everything laid out right and I remember having it set up and someone walked into my room and they were asking me questions about it and I was so embarrassed that I packed it all up and I never got it out ever again <laughs> <laughs> so it was, I think it was more of a, oh, this is strange. I don't think um, she really understands what's going on. I think she's just playing around with stuff. And then when I started my, my business, um, then I think people were like, oh, <laughs> she's like actually really serious about this. Um, so it, it, it wasn't that anyone necessarily dissuaded me from doing it. It's just, they were like, ah, she'll probably grow out of it. And then I just never did, never did. And now we're here. So maybe that's a, maybe that's a good thing. Righty ho. I find it very difficult to figure out where I am. I've actually realized that, um, I don't know, I didn't, I didn't know this before and I don't know if it's real, but I had people commenting and like sending me Instagram DMs saying that like, when they do YouTube lives, they have a Q and A section. I don't have a Q and A section. Maybe this is an America thing. I don't know, but I don't, I don't have a Q and A section. So I wish I did. So if it takes me a while to get through figuring out which are questions and which ones aren't, that's why it's because I'm trying to read like every single chat message that comes in to see what's a question and what isn't. And sometimes I do miss them. Oh, here we go. How, okay, so this one pre-warning is a little bit touching on um, mental health and compulsion. So just bear that in mind, I'll try and get through it fairly quickly. How do you navigate feelings of obsessive compulsion? So I'll be honest, I have been diagnosed with OCD for a long time. And the best thing I ever did was talk to someone about it. And I know that that is not accessible to everyone, but there are a lot of services out there now that are somewhere where you can go and you can talk to people about things from your own home. And there's a few definitely that I've seen on YouTube, things like BetterHelp. I don't know, and I'm not affiliated with any of them, but 
if you can't go and talk to an in-person therapist, it would be really good to talk to someone online that is trusted in this field that can really help you through it because the way people deal with it is entirely individual. And for me, I just found that talking with people and kind of learning different techniques for dealing with it has massively improved my life. And it should not be a taboo subject to talk about. And it's something that we should be way more open about, but I understand it's really difficult when it comes to mental health and the stigma around it. But if you do struggle with compulsions, I would really recommend if you are able to, to reach out to someone who can really help with this. And they do make a massive difference if you're able to. I've got that same song in my head and I don't know why. <laughs> Random tunes are always circling. If you're new here, um, welcome. I constantly have a piece of music in my head and I don't know what it is. <laughs> it's, it's basically what happens here. Oh, here we go. What is a good source for prep for... <sighs> words pet protection while doing spell work and ritual as my rottweilers insist on all on being with me all of the time so when it comes to this kind of thing it's always better safe than sorry and so if your animals do insist on being in a space with you when you are doing active spell work and ritual i'd always recommend nothing magical at all and instead just try your best to make sure that every possible thing is safe for pets because then if they do get their cute little noses in things and if they do lick the table you know that nothing is going to be harmful to them and it's not super magical it is just this kind of adaption that we have to do so a lot of people with pets won't burn incense so if they're doing kind of a as mentioned a few minutes ago that kind of ritualistic circle casting with representations for the different elements if you're doing something like that then try and substitute things out for candles and incense just to make sure that they're going to be staying safe and double, triple, quadruple check every single thing you are using plant-wise because by golly, there are some plants out there that you don't realise are as harmful as they are and then you really look into what happens if a dog interacts with them and you're like, oh, oh, okay, I'm going to keep that way, way away from them. So nothing magical there, mostly just... It's difficult to keep animals safe. Make sure that everything you're using is like double, triple, quadruple checked. Though I trust that you would do that anyway because I'd hope that everyone is a responsible pet owner. Right. Any experience with spirit boxes? What's your top way of communicating with spirits? So with this, I'm assuming spirit boxes as in kind of those communication boxes that spit out random collections of words. I think it depends on the brand, the kind of things that they do, but I know that some of them just kind of go through um, like radio signals for like fractions of a second and they kind of make this awful noise. <laughs> if you've heard a spirit box, you will know they make an absolute racket. They're awful, but they can be incredibly useful for communication if that's something that you do feel drawn to working with. And really it depends on which side of the fence you fall with spirit communication. I find even people who actively seek out spirits tend to fall on one side or the other, either the technological side of, I don't want to be interacting with something, because then I know that I'm not influencing it. So they'll go with like spirit boxes. They will go with um, like, um, what are they, oh my goodness, EVP. That's what I'm after, EVP things. I think it's EVP that I'm after. Oh my, my brain, mush. <laughs> Everything has just gone out of it. And they will like do recordings and things like that so that they are not directly influencing the outcome of that spirit communication. And then you'll get people on the other side of the fence where they're like, no. The spirits need energy to communicate with us, therefore I want to be involved. And so they'll work more with pendulums, with spirit boards, these kind of interactions. And people tend to be on one side of the fence or the other. And for me, it really is gonna depend on the kind of environment that you're in. If I'm in my own space and I am protected in my own environment with my own protections, then I'm quite happy to use things like spirit boards, pendulums, these kind of things for communication with spirits. However, if I am then going to be in an environment I don't know, with people that perhaps I don't trust entirely, 
then I am going to try and distance myself from physical interactions, mostly because I don't want to get myself put in harm's way. And I also don't entirely trust that everyone else in that environment is not trying to kid everyone else in that environment. Like it would be great to think that everyone wanted true spirit communication, but that's not always the case. So ultimately it's going to depend on kind of what you want out of that. For me, I typically stick to talking to them. Honestly, I have some of the strongest interactions with spirits just from being present in that space and asking them. If you think you've seen something, ask. And sometimes that thing will happen again and then again and again, or then you'll start getting knocks or you'll start getting bumps, bangs, things moving. And I find that to be really, really effective. And it also is often done by myself, which is super useful because then I can rule out external influences as well. So I think it's very much going to depend person to person. My favorite techniques are the simplest and then I would work up from there. But honestly, I really, really want to get some gear and just kind of experience it for myself and go out and see if by myself or maybe with a few other people, we can get some really cool experiences from a witchy perspective instead of from like a ghost hunter perspective. I think that would be really cool. If you had a relationship that gained you hobbies that you love, the relationship went very bad. If I do a cord cutting, will it diminish my enthusiasm for my hobbies? I don't think so. Mostly because cord cuttings are only they're only in place really for breaking the last remaining energetic and spiritual ties to someone that isn't in your life anymore. And if you love those hobbies, that's because you love those hobbies. You aren't loving those hobbies because someone else loves those hobbies. They might have attracted your interest to those hobbies or brought you into a space where you might experience it, but you still love those hobbies outright. That person being present doesn't mean you love them any less. So when you do a cord cutting, it's just gonna get rid of any of those leftover energies and spirit attachments, like spiritual attachments, rather than removing everything that was related to that person, if that makes sense. So really, if you love all of those hobbies that you've discovered through a previous partner, then that's fine. And that's gonna stick around afterwards. It's just the energy that's going to be removed. <laughs> Oh, oh, it jumped. Ah, oh, that, that happened quick, didn't it? I'm really hoping I didn't lose anything. If anything, that just tells me that I need to like speed up. Otherwise I'm gonna start losing things. So I remember that question. So I haven't lost that many. Okay, here we go. So what are your favorite nasty or baneful magical ingredients that aren't herbs or crystals? For example, cigarette butts, kind of etc. So. Ultimately, it depends on what people consider to be nasty because I find that some of the most useful things to me are kind of leftover things. So I find broken pins or like bent damaged pins, like sewing pins and stuff to be incredibly useful. Some people would look at a pin and go, oh, I'm not using that in my magic, that's evil. But the reality is it's simply a practical tool and the killing of objects, killing, like the serum, I'm trying to say this in a way that doesn't make it sound awful. You you would essentially like destroy objects for the purpose of transferring that energy into the spiritual plane. So you see it a lot with um, like gifts to water spirits or water deities. People would like bend swords before throwing them into the water. And they think that that relates to the idea that if you kill something, if you if you ruin its purpose in the physical world, it then becomes powerful in the spiritual world and it's it's a gift then to the spirits. So I find those kind of things like bent broken pins, things like that to be really useful. Um, ashes, ashes are so, so useful. Incense ashes, super, super great. I like incorporating them into water spells to kind of wash away unwanted things. And I also use them a lot in things like black salt, which I make a lot of. I have like a massive container of black salt. So I like using it for those kind of things. And then you've obviously got like the bodily stuff that people find really gross, but you can do it safely and you should always do it safely um, so that you can just, it's, it's just such a powerful thing to add into workings. And it doesn't have to be anything crazy, crazy dangerous. But, you know, if you want to get rid of something, spit on it. 
spit on it and then do the rest of your workings. And it's a great way of dealing with it. It's cheap, it's effective, people don't like it, but it is really, really powerful. And people have been using it for a very, very long time. And it's found all across the world, this kind of very visceral, personal practice that doesn't require a lot of items. So those things kind of really gross people out, but I think more needs to be said on it if only to make sure that people are staying safe. And if you're using anything like this, I would very, very highly recommend that you look into the safety of it and make sure you are being safe. If you don't feel comfortable, if you don't feel safe, don't do it. So, up next, how do you deal with toxic community pain? How do you deal with toxic community members? Um, it, it depends on how toxic we're talking about. Because the reality is, is that I don't have to agree with everyone and everyone doesn't have to agree with me. And that is completely fine. And people are within their right to be able to do that. When it comes to certain aspects of the witchcraft community, I tend to just step away. I'm, there's definitely certain aspects of it that I don't like that much that are very, my way is the only way anything less than my way is wrong. And I don't think that that is fair. And I don't think that is really open to the breadth of witchcraft and pagan traditions as a whole. There's so much variety out there. There's so many different people with different belief systems from different places who have different outlooks and they do things differently, but that doesn't make it bad. That just makes it different. And so in those situations, I do tend to just step away from it like it it's not my my place to be a part of it and that's fine you know i don't need to get involved in everything but when it does come and i've seen it time and time again on my channel is that you will have people actively targeting other members of the community with some horrific language and i think it's it's one of the downsides of being a content creator is people post comments thinking that no one is going to see them and they, they get out all of their kind of awful attitude and all of these horrible feelings and they will put it on other people in really, really awful ways. And I'm talking, you know, really bad. And when I see things like that, I will just block them because the reality is more often than not, it's not about the person that they are targeting, whether it's they're responding to someone else's comment. It's not about the person who wrote the first comment, usually it's an expression of something that they are dealing with. It's a bit like bullying, right? People who bully are usually struggling with something really, really bad. And so in that kind of situation, I tend to just take a step back and I just distance them from the rest of the community as well, because that kind of behavior is only going to negatively impact other people. It doesn't make them feel any better and it just drags everyone else down. And I don't like doing that. I try to avoid it where possible, but you do get a lot of people who will like spam hate and in some cases targeted hate at people for who they are. And so in which case, nope, bye. <laughs> and it's just what you have to deal with. The thing with any community is you're going to get a few bad apples and you just have to remember that a few bad apples does not spoil everyone. And um, the 1% that might be really horrible does not mean everyone is horrible. And sometimes save your peace is probably the best way to deal with it, is just take a step back and just save your peace. Can spirits present in a variety of forms? I have someone or something that floats about as a rough patch of black floating specks, which has a prominent presence and can move through my walls. Any idea what it is? Honestly, no. Mostly because you will find even individual spirits will come through in very, very different ways. So, I'm trying to figure I'm trying to figure out the most concise way of putting this, but forming a body, like a a human looking body as a non-corporeal spirit is incredibly difficult. And so it's it's one of those things where if you get a spirit that isn't strong enough or there isn't enough energy for them to fully manifest as a physical form, you can get bits and pieces. So you can get like disembodied voices. You might get just parts of them. So you might just see feet. That's a really common one actually is just feet. Or you'll see just a hand or, you know, part part of them. I've got the hiccups again as well. 
just part of them or you'll get disembodied voices or you will get that smell of a person even if that person isn't physically presenting to you and this is often because they don't know how or they don't have the energy to fully manifest so you might find that something is presenting in your space but they aren't able to come through fully so that could be what is being experienced here it could also be a non-corporeal spirit and not even just a non-corporeal spirit but a non-human non-corporeal spirit so you're looking at something that primarily moves around as this black mist and that could be anything and it's it's hard for me to say that because i don't i don't like vagueness but it could be anything and it's going to depend on where you are, the kind of place that you live, how old it is, what kind of land is there, the kind of people that were there before you, how long you've existed in that space, whether or not this is something that has been happening for days, weeks, months, years, decades. You know, is it something that's really recent that might come from an object that you've brought in or is it something that's really ancient like it's coming from the land? It is also going to depend on other things that you are experiencing. So phantom noises, phantom smells, any kind of feelings that you are getting from that environment because that's massively going to change the possible reason for this. So just a few examples, I suppose, that I can give for how, how it can drastically be different is if you have, say, brought in a new piece of jewelry or a new piece of furniture into that home. And so it's a new piece in your home and with it is coming strange knocks, strange bumps, you're experiencing unusual things. And from the moment you brought that into your new home, so it's a new home, newly built on land that you know, everything has been kind of a bit weird. And so you're seeing this shadow passing through walls and you're not quite sure what's going on, but it will link back to something that's attached to that unit. And over time, that spirit might become stronger and stronger and be able to present itself in a fuller and fuller way until you do get something that's more akin to a full body apparition. On the other side of that, you could be looking at a piece of land that's really, really old, that the history is very turbulent on it. You've done some digging in the back garden, for instance, you've taken out a tree, and then all of a sudden, from that moment onwards, this weird stuff has started happening. And not only have you disturbed the land, but you've also ended up with this strange smell in your home. It smells like dirt, like earth all the time. And you can't seem to shift this like earthy smell. And then you're also getting this spirit in that space. It is gonna be a very, very different experience. And it's probably come from a more elemental source than the first one, which could be a human that simply isn't presenting itself fully. I hope that makes sense as to kind of, the, the strong difference that can happen depending on other context. And it's the context that really has the power. So it has a small, it has a strong coffee smell. I was there when it moved in and it's a regular visitor. So in which case, we're looking at something that is gonna be related to that smell. So usually coffee is related to people, more often than not in my experience anyway. So if we're talking about a person, then it may well be that they are trying to get your attention and they're trying in lots of different ways. So the smell is there and also you get the movement. Does the movement of the mist go in the same pattern? Like, the, this, is, this is like my nerdy zone here. Because I'm, I'm interested here as to if it's always moving in the same pattern, it could be trying to get you to see something or to go somewhere with it. And so it, if that's the case, it may be worth following it, see where it's going to take you. It might give you a few more answers as to what's going on. If it's going through walls, it could be worth checking out original house plans if you can get hold of any to see if it's actually walking or moving in a route that would have been familiar to them. Because if that's the case, you can figure out a time period for that spirit's existence because usually the whole thing of like spirits walking through walls is not them being just being spooky <laughs> it's usually because they're following an original floor plan so the doors may have been in different places and even the the building height like the floor height might be different and so sometimes you'll see just like the torso of someone walking through a wall and it's not that they're only manifesting as a torso it's that the rest of them is actually on the floor level that they remember 
which I just think is, is really, really cool. So not always, but it comes in front of me, most common in the bathroom, which was a bedroom before. See, that might be really significant. It might be trying to get your attention of something that's happened there before, or trying, I don't know, it's a very, very interesting one, but it does sound human based off the coffee smell and kind of the repeated, the repeated action of it. But that's really interesting. So it may well be that there's something it's trying to tell you. And I know that sounds very, ooh, spooky, ghosty kind of thing, but it may well be that they, they've been spending all of their time, like since the moment that they've passed over, attempting to get something resolved. So it could be worth looking into the history of your house, see if anything ever happened there that was slightly untoward, anything significant that will have shown up in local newspapers, living memory, that kind of thing, just to see if by connecting the dots of spirit to incident and kind of talking to them about it, you might find that that activity changes or it might simply disappear once something is figured out. Oh, honestly, this kind of topic is my favorite. <laughs> I need to, um, I feel like I need to do more videos on like the spirity side. Can I help them in any way? I think that says yes. Um, it really depends on what they're after. So the first thing I'd say is acknowledgement. If you feel comfortable doing so, introduce yourself. You don't have to say your name or anything. You know, you, you can just say, hello, it's nice to see you again. And just have that acknowledgement of, I can actually see you because they might be trying to get a reaction or they might be trying to get someone's attention and they're not achieving it. So sometimes just that first kind of, I can actually see you might spur things on. Now that isn't always a good thing, but it could go really good. It might go not so great. Um, so just make sure protections are in place. You're able to deal with that. But that might be the first step to kind of figuring out what's going on here is just to let them know that, hey, I do, I do see you. If you want to, you can leave some alcohol out for them or coffee might be a great option actually, just like a little espresso shot of coffee left out that you can have as being their drink and like leave it to them, explain that that's exactly what you're doing, this is for them. And then after 12 hours or so, you can drain it away. And um, yeah, that's a great way of starting because it's just like really gentle and really small because if you're smelling coffee, it might be that you're smelling coffee for a significant reason. You often find especially older gentlemen would often have, it's kind of horrible to say, but when they en enter into a space, you either get cigar smoke or you will get the smell of strong alcohol. And that might not be because they were drinking all of the time, but it might be that that's their favorite thing. That's what they want to smell. And so that's how they come through to you. So you might find that that kind of thing is happening here, that you're constantly getting that coffee smell. And that could be a great offering to give just to kind of get things started and then see if you can figure out um, if any history to your house that might be a little bit untoward, that might relate to them. That could be a kind of a good step forwards. Okay, I feel like I've got to move on, otherwise I could just talk about this forever. Oh, do do ba bum 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 bum. Do you celebrate the Holly and Oak King? I don't know, uh, mostly because I am not Wiccan. And for me that, while the underlying kind of symbolism in that is something I do really strongly resonate with, the actual idea of like the Holly and Oak King having a battle and all of that stuff is not something that I personally connect with. But fundamentally, that's just that almost changing of the guard at this time of year is something that I do really connect with. Even if it's something that we don't actively see, it is that kind of returning of light. And all of a sudden, it's like the year just shifts. And instead of being waning, we're now in the waxing phase again. So that aspect I do connect with, but other aspects, perhaps not so much. But with that being said, these kind of stories are actually a great way of explaining these events to children, people who maybe don't understand why the Wheel of the Year interacts the way it does and why these things are symbolic. So it can be really useful in that regard to kind of teach others the patterns in the Wheel of the Year that maybe they wouldn't see otherwise. Oh, here we go. Do you still use almanacs? I do and I don't, so I, it's so annoying. I had an almanac bought for me at the start of this year and I loved it. I was like, I was going through it, absolutely adored it, 
really, really focused on it for about three months. And then I got distracted by something else and then I didn't check it till like October. But I do find almanacs useful even going forwards. So even just, like I still have some almanacs from 2016. I think I, I think I think that might be my earliest one is 2016. That's when I really started looking into them more. And I will still use information from the almanacs today because while the specific dates don't necessarily line up with the energies, you will find patterns and these things kind of shift about every, you know, few days it'll move in, a, in every few years it'll shift about by a few days is what I was trying to say. And so I will still use the almanacs even if I am not in that year. And honestly, a lot of them are full of information. I don't think I've got one in reaching distance. I think they might all be over there, but there's also a lot of information. The Llewellyn ones are particularly good for that. They have a lot of information crammed into them with only a little bit of the like calendar aspect, which is so useful. And there's a reason people still collect them is that they always have such good information from authors that you will definitely recognize if you really enjoy reading witchy books. These trousers on this chair were a terrible decision. It won't stop squeaking. <laughs> oh no. Okay. I just gotta try and not move. I I, I shuffle so, so much. And it, it's, yeah, I've gotta stop shuffling. Right, where was I? Oh, here we go. Any advice to get over the fear of backfires? Would really like to do magic for self or family? It just jumped. Oh no. <laughs> um, any advice? Okay, so I have done an entire video on backfires and people always say to me, oh, but Hearth, you never told us how to stop a backfire from happening. And essentially it's everything in that video on backfires is you, you do the opposite of it. So it, instead of not finishing a spell fully, you would finish a spell fully. So that video might be really useful because it tells you the main reasons why I've experienced backfires and why people I know have experienced backfires. And then you can figure out workarounds for them. But for anyone who doesn't know, a backfire is guaranteed not as bad as people think it is. So a backfire is when a spell goes kind of awry. And usually this happens for any of a number of reasons. So sometimes spells can appear to go wrong when actually it's more that you hadn't targeted the spell effectively. So you just said, I would like to earn more money, but you didn't tell anyone or anything how you wanted that to manifest. And so what happened was you lost your job so that you could then find a new job that offers you more money. But at the time it feels like a massive backfire on that working but it isn't actually a backfire. It's just the working manifesting in a way that you weren't expecting. And that can be really, really jarring, understandably so. Another common reason that people experience backfires is not so much that it's a backfire and more that it's leftover energy manifesting in your life. So if I have done a spell to help cut the cords of a situation that I'm really not liking so much or if I've done a spell to help my best friend for instance find new romantic interests. If I'm doing these two workings and I haven't released the energy of either of these workings fully I might experience random people coming into my life wanting a relationship with me and I might find that my relationship starts falling to pieces because that cutting cords energy is attaching onto my own energy. And so it's separating things in my own life. And it might sound like those workings have gone really, really wrong when actually it's just that energy has been left over. So those are the two main reasons that people that I know personally have experienced this kind of backfired energy and it's really easy to fix. So when it comes to the first aspect, it's about directing that energy and focusing it purposefully. And it's why vague spells and rituals are not always a good idea. You know, I want friends might lead you to having a lot of people in your life that are really bad friends because you didn't specify what kind of person you wanted in your life. You just said you wanted anybody and that anybody could be really bad for you. If you want money, then really target what it is that you want. Because if you just say money, you might find that it's an accident that you get insurance money over and that's not what you wanted in the first place. So I always say, try to be specific, but not difficult. So if you're looking for a new job or if you're looking for more money in your job, be really specific about that. So say that you would like 
to improve your performance at work so that you can be put forward for the promotion that's happening, I don't know, in February. And that is what you really wanna work on. You want to improve yourself physically and then energetically you're aiming towards that promotion. And that's how you're going to gain that extra money. So you're gonna be adding in things like money herbs, money oils, green or gold candles, these kind of things that you wanna focus that intention, but the intention is really, really solid. If you want to attract friends into your life, but you want actual really good friends, then you might want to say that you want to meet like-minded people that you can really connect with and get along with really well for the betterment of everyone involved. It's still asking for friends, it just means that you're less likely to get some random person that's gonna really harm your life in a year's time. You don't want to be so specific though that you're making things difficult. And this can happen with especially things like attraction spells, if you want to attract a romantic partner in your life, what you don't want to do is to say, I need them to be called Ken and I need them to be six foot two and blonde with blue eyes and I need them to look like a Ken doll and I need them to have this job with this salary and drive this car and live in this area because that is just way, 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 way too specific. And while that person might exist, they also might be a terrible person and you might not want to deal with them. So it's much better to kind of have specific without being really, really difficult to achieve. When it comes to releasing all of that energy, it's there's kind of two ways of doing it. So the first is to practice your energy manipulation skills. And then when you're doing that working, you are really pushing everything out. Whether you are pushing it into an object or out to the ether to manifest however it will manifest, it doesn't really matter. Any energy that you've raised for that working, you want to be directing it into or out of the area that you're working in so that you can really release that energy and manifest it fully. If you're in any doubt, however, ground any leftover energy. So I do have that practice on my channel. It is a separate video in itself where you can learn that kind of grounding skill that I do personally. And if in any doubt, if you feel like you've got some leftover energy and you don't want it in your space, return it down into the earth, get it out of your system, out of your energy field, and then you're not gonna have any issues with it manifesting strangely. The only other big reason that I haven't touched on already why things might backfire is if you're targeting spells and rituals on people with strong protections. And sometimes, especially other practitioners, they might send that spell back at you again. Best way to avoid this is to not necessarily target any individual person with magic. Even if you're wanting to help someone, it can be really useful to target a space or give them something that they can take with them to help manifest that aid, then you're not gonna run the risk of anything kind of ricocheting back off their protections, especially if they do have any spirits or familiars, these kind of things. So generally, backlashes are not as bad or backfires are not as bad as people think they are. And usually they are easily resolved if you can pinpoint what it is that's the cause. If you haven't already, do feel free to check out that video and it goes way more in depth than, than I can here. Now, while I'm at the bottom of the chat here, I am just gonna say thank you to a few people. So thank you so much to Daniela, thank you. Honestly, thank you for all of your continued support. It means a lot to me. I'm, I'm Claw, Claire, I'm Claw, I'm Claire Audient, or Claire Audient, and I wanted to see if you had any tips on how to make messages clearer. So, this one is kind of tricky, especially if we live in like a busy environment and noise is happening. So one thing that you can always give a go, it depends on how you're getting messages through. So some people will get them through their subconscious and other people will get them through external influences. So if it's subconscious, you might wanna try setting aside some time where you can put in some earplugs or some noise canceling headphones and have that be a designated time. So you are making space, you are even addressing out loud if that's something you wanted, or you can have a candle that is specifically laid out so that when that is burning and you've got your headphones in, you've got your earplugs in, that is a time where you can get communications to come through. And you can even be doing you know, some, some card reading, some meditation at the same time if you want to try and heighten it that way. The other way of doing it is almost to, focus on it is not the right word per se because when we over focus on something we can have a tendency to pick up on unusual things that are just normal sounds 
but it could be worth, as in the previous one, making a little bit of time where we are focusing on other things and we are actively taking note of everything that we are experiencing. And then we are trying to debunk things can be really useful. So spend like an hour in the evening, for instance, and write down anything that you might be getting through, any thought that you might be getting through, any knock, bump, sound, any slight whispering in the distance, write it all down. And then see if you have any patterns coming through, because I don't know if anyone else has experienced this, but I definitely have. You'll get to the same point every night, and then I can hear whispering. And the whispering, at first, I was thinking, oh, that's just my next door neighbor. And then I was realizing that even when my next door neighbor was on holiday, the whispering was still happening at the same time. And by having that like small section of time every evening to set aside to listening to everything, not to do it all day because that would be exhausting, you might find that things are happening in your space repeatedly at set times, or you'll get the same voices, the same experiences coming through. And normally you would have dismissed it as being an external source, but you're able to see the patterns in it because you are documenting it every single day. And also as with all kind of psychic abilities, you do often find that um, the more we focus on things, the more we acknowledge things, the more clearly things will start coming through. So I really hope that helps. Um, it's not something that I've fully trained myself completely. It's something I'm working on. So hopefully the tips will help you as they're currently uh, trying to help me, <laughs> trying. And thank you so, so much to, oh, I'm going to butcher this, Betania. I really hope that's right. Thank you so much. And also to Pam. Thank you so much. I really hope it, um, all the, the conversation about spirits earlier helped. And to, oh my goodness, it's, sign bald or it might be kine bald so i'm thinking sign bald thank you so much and to rowan crane and also to lotus thank you so much and blessed you all to everyone who is choosing to celebrate so with lotus's question we have how can i remove negative energy that just won't go away i've tried most common things and can't seem to get out darkness so when it comes to Things like this, if you've tried the really simple techniques, we're gonna have to go bigger. And the bigger might sound scary, but we're, we're gonna have to try and go bigger. So if you can figure out where this energy is coming from, that is going to massively help the situation. So if you have, for instance, a, an object that you've brought in and that's where the focus of all that energy is coming from, or there was a particular event where all of this energy started after that point, that's gonna be a massive help to how you all kind of progress from there. So a banishing is probably the next big step. And this is after you've obviously done all of your basic house cleanses, you've told anything to leave that you want to get rid of, after all of that kind of stuff. A banishing is probably the next best step. Now, a banish is not going to completely eradicate the things that are interfering with you energetically. It's not gonna remove spirits entirely from this plane of existence. But what it does is it allows us to push distance between us and the energy that we want to be removing. And this is why I say it's really useful to have an understanding of what it is that you're getting rid of. So if it is an object, I would recommend taking that object outside. If you have an idea of who brought that energy in, that's gonna be really useful because that energy might still be partially attached to that person and they might not realize it. It might be someone that you don't wanna let back in your home again. It might be a particular occasion where from this point onwards, you know that your environment is particularly sensitive to that strong emotion. and You might not want to kind of feed that too much in your environment in case this comes back again. But when it comes to banishings, it gen generally goes cleanse, banish, cleanse, protect. So actually I've brought so many things. So the way to deal with this, actually I have done a full video on this. If you wanna check it out, it's on my channel. It's called uh, House Haunted. I'm gonna check this, I should know this. It's my channel. Let me see what the, what the actual video is called. Um, 
I can't spell today. So when you're dealing with an unknown cause, like it's, it's an unknown object, trial and error is the best way. So the video is called Haunted at Home, Reasons for House Hauntings. And I just opened my editor. I'm doing very badly today at this. So what I would do is if you've got a series of items and you're not sure which one is the culprit for bringing in this unwanted energy, I hope that my stream is still functioning. That went very strange. Oh, I'm just gonna learn to not click things. That went very, very weird. So, um, so if it's if if it's an object you've brought into your home, try isolating objects. So having taking every object, I know it can be re it can be such a pain in the ass. Taking every object out, or start by taking individual objects and putting them outside of your home. Whether that's a shed, whether that is a garage, whether that's just into a different room, if it is affecting you see if the removal of that one object improves the situation. If it does, bring that object back in again and see if you still get that negative feeling. Because if you do, then that object is the cause. And so that is the object you're going to want to be working on. If the first object isn't it, work through some more and see if you can figure out the cause that is attached to an object, because that's gonna make this way easier. If it turns out that it is an object, take the object outside, completely remove it from your home, cleanse your home, make sure that all of that energy has been sent outside with that object. And then you're gonna to want to cleanse, banish, cleanse, protect. And I always do it in that order because it just makes sure that nothing is not gonna reattach itself again. So by cleansing that object, you're gonna disrupt all of that unwanted energy that's kind of in in the object, around the object, attached onto the object, you then banish it. Now there's so many different spells out there for banishing. Feel free to choose one that is most appropriate to your tradition and your style of practice. No one spell is gonna suit every kind of environment or situation. So have a look around and see what you can find. That banish is then going to push that energy away from the object. So it's gonna distance it from the object. You want to cleanse yourself and that object to make sure that it is not going to reattach. And then when you bring it inside again, you're gonna to want to put up protections to stop that energy from getting back inside. And that you don't have to do with an object. It's easier if you can figure out the cause of it. The other way of doing it is inside a home, if you don't know what's causing it, you would do the same again. Cleanse, banish, cleanse, protect. But this time you're gonna cleanse the entire space and yourself you're going to want to banish with all the windows and doors open to really send it outside. You're then gonna to want to cleanse your space again to make sure that energy can't reattach and then protect your space to make sure it can't come back in again. And you would do the same if it is something that's attached to you as well. That way you're making sure that it is staying out and do make sure then that anyone that's coming and going has protections on them, whether they are things that they are carrying or things that are done in the home. So that, that way that energy can't reattach on again. And I really hope that that helps. It's a massive step up from basic cleanses but if a basic cleanse is not working and even more intensive cleanses aren't working, that could be something that's happening. It could also, I feel like I should mention, be a spirit that is simply residing in that space. And in which case it is up to you then to decide if after every other technique isn't working and you still feel this really uncomfortable energy, whether it's time to put your foot down and remove them from that space if nothing else is going to work. So. That was a lot, I know. Um, I'm gonna get back to, up to where I was in the chat because I don't wanna miss out on anyone's questions, but thank you so much to everyone who has donated so far in the stream. It massively helps support me. And um, yeah, thank you so much. Okay, where was I? I was somewhere over here, I think. I think. Yes, I was, here we go. Um, what is the best way to open your third eye chakra in a gentle and gradual manner? This is one where straight out, I don't work with the chakras. And so I would recommend if you can finding a content creator, a book, someone out there who does work with the chakras. If anyone has any recommendations, feel free to put them in the chat. I'm not particularly well versed in it, but it's definitely something I'd recommend looking into from um, a person who actually has a full understanding of it. I have a very brief understanding of the chakras, but nothing intense. How do you deal with executive dysfunction and procrastination? 
I don't. Panic? Panic. Might be a good option. Panic. Um, I am really, really bad at putting things off. Always have been, probably always will be. I'm trying really hard <laughs> to get better at it. But I find that setting deadlines for myself is really, really useful. And if I tell someone that I am planning on doing something, it means that therefore I have to do it. <laughs> and that is how I get around it. I've always been really, really bad at actually doing things before I need to. I will always remember my dissertation, my final year dissertation at university. I did an all-nighter and I was still editing it at like 6 45 and I had to hand it in by 7 a.m. So I just remember running across the campus to get my dissertation in on time. I did it. <laughs> and I think I only did it because there was a massive, massive deadline. Otherwise I would have managed to procrastinate that for years. So maybe set yourself mini deadlines. Like they don't have to be super intensive ones. But if you say to someone, hey, I'm gonna do this and I'm gonna do it before this date, you might find that that's useful to have someone holding you accountable for the deadline that you've set. Otherwise you might just run away from it. So I. I tend to do that or I will set like in my Google, it's not a Google calendar, what is it, like an Apple calendar? I don't know. In my calendar, I will write like when a video has to be done by. And that's what I'm going to do this year is that this coming year, I'm right, I'm like pre-planning loads of videos so that I have to get it done on time because I am notorious for spending too long editing and not getting it done in time. So let's have a look. Uh, any books on astrology? I want to learn to read my map, but every source I find is just so confusing. Yes. Astrology is massively confusing for a lot of people, and it depends on the kind of astrology that you're looking into. I don't have any particularly detailed books on astrology that I would recommend. I mean, I've got a few on the Mercury retrograde and some that are vaguely about reading your natal chart, but honestly, I find it very, very difficult. It could be useful if you haven't already to get your natal chart and there's loads and loads of um, websites online that will do it. Try to fill it in with as much information as you can and then get the information about that natal chart that comes underneath it and then try to figure out your own natal chart from that and then compare it to books as well as people in the field who are particularly well versed. If anyone, as mentioned with the, the previous one, has any knowledge on people who are particularly good at astrology that are content creators that are going to have more information, do let me know and um, let everyone else know in the chat as well because that would be great for everyone to follow, I think. It's something that is really, really confusing and it very much depends on which type of... Um, astrology you're looking at because there's two as far as I'm aware there's two main different versions and they read quite differently and so the one you choose is going to massively change the outcome how do I set up a oh, words <laughs> how I don't know how to set up a bridged altar in an area that I know isn't exactly open to the craft have an altar on your phone I actually, do I have it here? I actually don't know if I do. So on my tablet that I use, I have to clear, ev I have like piled stuff on top of it. So this could just be one good example because I don't have a Keronos altar and I, I really want one, but I don't have one right now. So instead I have on my screen, I'm not sure if you're gonna be able to see this properly, but I have Keronos <laughs> on my screen. And this is like my, mini altar every single time I open it to do some work he's right there I can honor him there if I wanted to I can have it so the screen doesn't lock and I can have it as like a almost a shrine type space where I can do workings with him that's a great option you can do them in different I know so many people who do like minecraft altars which is just so creative it's amazing people who make altars in a notebook so that you can have it so the notebook is propped up open on something and you have essentially a flat working space in front of it. Don't burn candles on it though, that's kind of dangerous. And then you can have like imagery in the background that represents that altar and then you can prop that up when you want to do your workings and then when you're done with those workings or that honoring or giving those offerings, you can close it again and you still have that space and you're still keeping yourself safe and secure in an environment that might not be accepting of it. You can do portable altars in small boxes, shoe boxes, you can get wooden boxes from like craft stores. Um, people use like, um, I, I used to use an old pencil case, like a metal pencil case. 
And so I've used that for an altar before so that there are ways of working around it. It's just gonna depend on how big you want it or how comfortable you are with it. If you are really creative as well, if you like drawing, you can draw your own altar in like a, like procreate or something like that to have your own environment that way. And uh, it means that you can be safe and secure. You don't have to worry about it. And also altars aren't a requirement. So if you, if you don't feel like you need one, you don't need one. You can just work with that deity just by communing with them. The, the just being present for them and opening that space up to them is just as powerful as having an altar. It's just some people like having the additional visualization ability of having it like right in front of them. Do you have a spell to manifest a holiday? So when it comes to things like that, it is all about setting your intentions and focusing on what you need. So it's probably easier in this instance to figure out what is inhibiting you or stopping you from going on that trip and then doing the workings and the work to line everything up to make that possible. So rather than doing a spell to manifest a holiday, instead you might be doing those workings to help ease the bumps on say finances or getting the time off work or these kind of things to help manifest that goal. That's probably an easier way of doing it because you're doing lots of smaller workings instead of one that's trying to achieve everything. What's your opinion on Alistair Crowley and the, I always say this wrong, Thalema is how it's always been said to me, but no matter what I say, someone will tell me I'm pronouncing it wrong, so I don't know, I give up. Um, I can't make heads or tails of them and their views. Their books made me have really bad headaches and they gave me lots of off feelings. Yeah, the energy of all of that is very, very unusual and it's definitely not going to be for everyone and it's one of those where if something is making you feel uncomfortable if something is giving you headaches trust me been there done that try not to push through because it usually doesn't get any better usually it gets worse and if something is giving you a really really visceral reaction like that it's probably a good sign to take a step back maybe it's not the right time to be looking into it maybe it's just something that your spirits are saying that no this is not this is not it let's not do that um for me, I have a few books on Alistair Crowley. I've not looked too deeply into much so far. And already I know that the books I have have strange energy to them. It is not horrible, but it's definitely not going to be everyone's cup of tea. So if you want to look into him and you want to look into the Thalema, it's it's not gonna be for everyone. And be braced because some of it is gonna be a little bit not not nice. <laughs> like it just isn't there's a reason that he is one of the most disliked figures in occult history not by everyone but there is a reason he's very splitty <laughs> he splits people and uh it, yeah be braced for it can you give any advice on any rituals or practices i can do tomorrow for the winter solstice i don't have all the herbs so something simple but powerful a bit like me damn right um it ultimately depends on what you're after for me i'm waking up at <sighs> ridiculous hour tomorrow morning <laughs> to be able to watch the sunrise and i've looked at the forecast and it's going to be cloudy for the fourth year in a row so <laughs> um if you don't have anything else planned and you fancy getting up at ridiculous hour in the morning um, they have them at Stonehenge, they do a live stream, and they also do one in Ireland at, I've forgotten where it is in Ireland. They do one in Ireland, and it, that one's really, really beautiful. Why have I forgotten it? I don't, I've completely forgotten it. Anyway, they do the live stream, so that's what I'm going to be focusing on tomorrow, because I'm finishing up a lot of my workings I'm already doing. I'm going to be doing the live stream. If you want to, you can do a working that is simply to honor bringing in the light. So if you just have a tea light and you fancy getting up at ridiculous hour, um, I don't actually know what time the sunrise is. I think I think the live stream start at like 7.30, which actually isn't that bad. <laughs> Thinking about it, that's not that bad. Um, you can always wake up with the sunrise and light a single candle. Say a few words to honor the sun as it returns because we are getting from this, from kind of tomorrow onwards, everything's gonna start coming back in again from the Northern Hemisphere. And so that's a really, really simple way of doing it. 
If you want to, while you're lighting that candle, you can also say some words, try to manifest things, focus on the intentions of things that you want to grow as the sun begins to build up over the next six months. And you can have that be like the setting out of potential goals and workings and energy that you want to manifest that you are whispering into that candle as you're having it lit and then just allow it to go out by itself. That's just a super duper simple one. And um, yeah, New Grange. <laughs> That's the place in Ireland, New Grange, that's what I was thinking of. Um, that one is really, really, really beautiful. And I, um, <laughs> listen to me just literally, um, I get a lot of people asking like, where's the live stream, where's the live stream? It's on YouTube. So if I can, if I remember, I'll try to post it on my Instagram stories tomorrow, the link to it, if, if I'm able to, I'm not sure if I can, but I'll give it a go and see if um, I can share it with people because it is so, so beautiful if the sun's out that's the problem we live in england and some people island um depending on which one you're watching and it's very gray here um so typically the sun isn't out but i know that in previous years they show past live streams of the sunrise when it was sunny so that is something to enjoy oh i'm gonna sneeze i don't want to sneeze uh. Rabbit noise, rabbit noise. Oh, here we go. Oh, okay. I like this question. And this is going to divide people. So just bear in mind, I'm not the be all end all of knowledge and please do own research. Okay. What are the differences between folk magic, traditional witchcraft and modern witchcraft? Ooh, ooh, ooh. Okay. So traditional witchcraft is actually not all that traditional. So traditional witchcraft is a term that was used to describe kind of collections of practices that were based off folk tradition, like boast, bo based off pre-existing practices that have been adapted into a system that was often used by collective groups. So traditional witchcraft is not one thing, but there are aspects of it that do flow through most varieties of traditional witchcraft. So they are often based off folk magic and so the link between folk magic and traditional witchcraft is really really close and I actually have a video coming out if not next week the week after about my favorite traditional witchcraft books that I would recommend to people who are getting started and in that list is one maybe two books that are more on folk magic than they are on traditional witchcraft because I do think they kind of tie together really nicely so you'll often find that elemental directions are based off pre-existing belief or beliefs associated with the land. So for instance, in Gemma Gary's The Cornish Book of Ways, you'll find that the elemental directions are different than the elemental directions you will find in Wicca because it makes the most sense for the land that that magic is being worked upon. Traditional witchcraft is a formalized adaptation on pre-existing tradition, a little bit like how Wicca is. It's just a different version. It's like a different form of it. Modern witchcraft is kind of less about tradition and more about what works. And I don't know if everyone is gonna feel the same way about that, but I often find that modern witchcraft primarily focuses on manifesting things that are successful, not necessarily following the dogma of any particular tradition. And so you'll find that they will have lots of different aspects of practice. They're a little bit more eclectic in nature and they will essentially do things in a way that works rather than following any set laid out tradition. None is better, worse than the other. It's just different. For me, I tend to focus on a more folk magic practice and some of that ties into aspects of traditional witchcraft. Folk magic is going to vary depending on where you are. It is not one thing in every place. It is based off the magic of the past, the magic of the land, and the magic of the everyday people. And so folk magic in one part of the world is going to be very different to folk magic in another. And these are usually drawn into modern practice based off the bits and pieces of sources that we have left. So in the UK, you have different charms that have been found, different objects and items that have been buried or kept in walls or 
were kept in fireplaces, traditions that have been written down or oral traditions that have been passed on through things like song and also through families, they then get adapted into modern practice, piecing together the things that we know about history and know about historical magical practice to adapt them into a more modern system which is then where traditional witchcraft kind of picks those pieces up and forms them into a set, not really a set system, but something a little bit more unified. And you will find that folk magic books and traditional witchcraft books are entirely regional. So you can pick up a book from Cornwall and then you can pick up a book from Essex and they're gonna say very different things. You can have a look at different traditions from around the world and they're going to be very different because it's based off the land and the energies and spirits of that place. So those are the main kind of differences. None is better, none is worse. It just depends on what you feel most drawn to. Some people way prefer modern practice where it's a little bit more up to date. It's a little bit less system focused. So it, it's not ritual magic. It's not ceremonial magic. It is results focused magic rather than, because some of the ceremonies in some traditional witchcraft books are intense. <laughs> Like intense and that's not going to be for everyone i went on about that for way too long i'm so sorry i should probably do a full video on like different types of witchcraft again because i did it once and i need to do more i keep saying i'm going to do more and then i keep forgetting speaking of contacting the dead what is your take in reconciling ancestor work with the idea of reincarnation as i see both views held within the witchy community so this is one where I think it's more than anything for me, it's about aspects of people. And it's the same thing when it comes to spirit communication is that I find that when you are communicating with a spirit, you're almost communicating with a fragment of that person. If you are seeing the same spirit manifesting and they're walking the same route all day, every day, it's, it's more like an echo of them than it is the entirety of that person. And when we work with spirit communication, I definitely find that spirits are often one track minded. Not all, but some of them. So some spirits are very one track minded. So they're very, I want to talk about this subject. I want you to come here with me. And they will repeat that same thing over and over and over and over again. And if you ask them anything else, they will not give you an answer. All they want is for you to talk to them about one thing or go to this one place with them and anything else they don't care about. So for me, that's very much a kind of a fragment of that person that's left behind. When we're working with ancestors, and it, it's going to be different for everyone, and it's very, very dependent on tradition and culture, religion, background, all of these things. If anything, I find it to be the part of them that lives through me. So even if someone isn't a blood-related ancestor, their connection with my life has a significant impact on it. That could be if you are adopted, for instance, your adopted grandparents. You might not be blood related to them, but they had a serious impact on your upbringing, on who you are as an adult, and that still holds meaning. And that ancestor work will still connect and will still work because it's not necessarily about blood ancestors, it's about the people who shaped us. And while that does include blood relations, it doesn't always have to. And so for me, ancestor work is if anything, that connection with the people who have shaped who I am, whether that is through my genetics, whether that is through my worldview or my experiences with them as a child or even as an adult, that is my ancestor work, is recognizing and acknowledging the significance of the people that came before me. And some people, depending on culture and tradition, they are still walking around as full spirits full people that are around you constantly. For other people, it's more about this echo of how they related to you. When it comes to reincarnation, once again, some people have the idea that it's a fragment of them that stays behind and a fragment of them that goes. It is their energy, their kind of their core that moves on into something else. And it's who they were in this life that stays behind as spirits, as ancestors. And it's that core aspect of energy that gets pushed forwards into another life. There's so many different ways that people 
look at it. And I don't think that any is necessarily right or wrong. It's just, it's a fascinating subject. It really is so interesting. And I don't think anyone is ever gonna know for sure. I, I find that there's a lot of confusion in the witchy community, mostly because you've got people from all different religions, traditions, cultures, backgrounds. And so each individual system and belief system behind that person is going to influence how they look at things. Oh, oh my, Shane, oh my goodness. <laughs> I'm, so, I'm, I was just about to say I need to sit down, but I'm already sitting down. Oh my, thank you so, so much. Honestly, I, I always see your beautiful smiling face on loads of streams and it lights up my day. And thank you so, so much for supporting constantly in watching and everything that you do. Thank you so, so much. I hope you have an amazing Yule and I'm honestly really glad that you enjoy watching the streams. <laughs> oh my God. Thank you so, so much. And yeah, hopefully more travel things will be coming to Instagram hopefully, maybe, but thank you so, so much. And I'm just glad that you enjoy the streams as much as I love, I, I enjoy and love interacting with everyone. Words, mush, words are hard. Okay. <laughs> I'm gonna have to, I'm, I, okay, I'm not crying. I'm not crying on stream. I will be good, suck it in. Okay, I'm fine. <laughs> oh dear. Right. Ooh, here we go. So have you ever thought about sharing a Google Doc or other collaborative document for each stream to collect questions? Yes. So this actually kind of perfectly ties in with what I'm actually going to be doing next year. So I did post a poll on my on my YouTube community tab that was asking about this and people were getting understandably so frustrated, so was I, at the fact that the stream keeps jumping. So my thought was every other stream I am going to be taking from a list of questions um, that have been pre-submitted. That doesn't mean that the entire stream is just gonna be me answering those questions. I'll probably pick like a selection of questions and then I'll answer kind of sub questions that people are submitting live so that we can kind of focus on topics for the stream instead of loads and loads of random questions. And that means if you have a specific question that's been missed several streams because the stream has jumped, you can put it on the Google Doc. And it also gives me something to focus on for videos. If I think something is too big to just be in the stream, I'll do a whole separate video on it to answer that question separately. But I don't wanna be doing that all of the time. So it's going to be like one month, and then the other is a normal stream, one month, a normal stream, just to kind of give people a mix and match of what they want to see. But I will still be chatting with people in the chat, interacting with people directly, all of that kind of stuff. Just, I don't risk losing all of the questions like I do sometimes. So that's the plan for next year. So look out for a Google Doc, it will be, or some other system. I'm not, I'm not really sure what I'm gonna use yet but that will be on the community tab and um, when it does go up so that then people can start submitting questions. I apologize if I don't get around to everyone's, but it is just the fact that I, I know from experience that there's going to be a lot. So just, just bear with me on that one, please. <laughs> Pretty please, okay. Uh, where was I? I'm, I'm so f close to the top of the stream, by the way. I've like barely, barely even like scratched the surface on the stream, so. Oh, here we go. How do you separate tinnitus from spirits speaking to you? Because I heard the ringing in my ears can be spirits trying to communicate with mediums and clairvoyant people. Generally speaking, if you have seen a professional, which I would recommend you do if you have tinnitus, make sure that what you're dealing with is what you think you're dealing with, then spirit communication... Okay, mm, I'm gonna reset. So when it comes to hearing, a lot of people... It's a little bit like the old wives' tales of if your ears are burning, it means someone's talking about you. If this hand itches, it means this. If that hand itches, it means something else. And people often say that the flashbangs that people get in their ears, you know when all of a sudden you, it, one ear just starts ringing and then in a few seconds it goes away? People will often say that that is related to spirit communication and all of this stuff when most of the time all of these things have mundane causes. And I am the first to say, make sure you rule out the mundane before you go to the magical. 
And when it comes to this, make sure that you are seeing the right people. Make sure that your hearing is fine because once it is gone, it is very difficult to do anything about it. So please make sure we're always protecting our hearing. Wear hearing protection when we're going to concerts and loud events like bonfire night. I realize that most Americans don't know what bonfire night is. Fourth of July, there we go. That's kind of a (laughs) similar vibe, lots of fireworks. Make sure you're doing everything like that to protect your hearing. And if you are wondering about it, do make sure that you go to see someone to make sure that you are not dealing with anything underlying. Now, when it comes to spirit communication, when when it comes to hearing spirit communication, I tend to find it actually goes slightly different um, in that I don't have ringing. I mean, I have tinnitus, um, but I don't have ringing in my ears in relation to spirit. Instead, I get knocking lots of knocking, tapping, banging. That is the thing that typically happens for me and I will get whispering. It's almost like someone is having a conversation in a different room and they're like trying to keep a really hushed voice and you can discern different voices, but you can't tell what they're saying. That for me is the big thing I get when it comes to hearing spirits. And so it might be worth, as I mentioned previously in the stream, to keep note of everything you're experiencing because you might find that there are other sensations that you are getting that are not just the ringing in your ears that you can then focus on. And then if you want to, you can communicate with the spirits, talk to them and say, if you could, can you please communicate with me in this way rather than that way? And it'll just help rule out um, kind of any mix-ups with tinnitus, spirit communication, that kind of thing. I'm boiling in here, so I'm gonna go turn the heater off. I'll be back in a moment. Oh, goodness. I realized that the room is actually warmer than I thought it was earlier. (laughs) Oh, right. Now I'm not going to melt. I always forget, see, because like I I walk into this room and it is freezing because like this room's always incredibly cold. And so I stick the heater on and then I'm like, oh my goodness, why am I so warm? And it's because I've got two filming lights on me. (laughs) and a computer and a heater and it gets very warm. So let's have a look. Where was I? Oh no, I don't know where I was. Ah. Oh, so this one is kind of along the same line. I've got a couple of questions like this. What do you think is the best kind of spell for improving physical health? Anything Anything that is working alongside things that are already being done is great. Um, And it's where I would typically stick to, especially when we're talking on social media because people have a tendency to replace the mundane with the magical. Um, So do make sure you're always going through mundane means, doing everything you can, but then you can do kind of additional spells and rituals on top of that, which will bolster the effectiveness of that. Whether it is drawing energy from other sources that you can direct towards a specific goal, such as healing, whether it is doing healing magics, whether it is targeting it towards specific things that are being done and good luck, good fortune workings for particular things, they're all really effective for kind of adding onto the science and the medicine that is already in place. And as always, please don't replace the mundane and the scientific for the magical. They can work together incredibly effectively and it just means that everyone is staying safe. Right. I need to figure out where I was. Ooh, okay. Um, this one I've kind of already answered in a way. Okay, this is kind of back to back. Okay. <laughs> My brain is running at like a thousand miles a minute. I need to chill. So I have unpleasant dreams and even terrifying nightmares every single night. My life is just everyday stress at work, home routines, etc. Nothing major or unusual. How to stop the bad dreams. I obviously don't know you and I don't know your life, but I kind of feel like you've answered that in your own question. Just from an outside perspective, you describe being stressed every single day with work and home routines as being nothing major or unusual. That's pretty unusual, and that is gonna have a massive impact on sleep, on our mental health, and I think more than anything, that's going to be the cause of this. Um, I'm not a sleep specialist, of course, but, to be so stressed all day, every day is going to have a massive impact on us. Physically, mentally, emotionally, it's gonna impact our sleep, our subconscious. And so I'd say, if anything, 
finding ways of dealing with that stress and processing it, um, ways of getting your mind to relax and calm down before bed may well massively help the situation. And generally, it will probably improve other aspects of your life as well. Because being that stressed all the time is, while not uncommon in our modern society, it shouldn't be that way for good sleep and good mental health and for dreams as well and magic and all that kind of stuff. Like it's, it has a negative impact on so much of your life if you are that stressed. And then next to that we have, how do you know the difference between a dream of travel and astral projection episodes? So it is gonna vary person to person. I find that my astral travel means that I wake up exhausted. <laughs> so I can be dreaming of flying somewhere, for instance, and I will wake up from that. And the one thing that I notice really quickly is I will wake up from it and I feel like I've been asleep. Like I feel kind of groggy. It's kind of hard to, to get up. It's kind of uh, like tired. Like you takes you a while to get out of that dream type state. And with that also comes the jumping of dreams. And this is the big indicator for me because when we dream, I'm, as mentioned, not a dream specialist, but from what I've researched, we dream for set amount of times and it's, it, we like drop into one dream and then it'll suddenly jump to something else. And it's usually like 10 minutes I found of being in one scene of a dream. And then all of a sudden you're somewhere else and you don't know how you've got there and you're talking to a different person or you're looking at something else or you're wearing different clothes and you're like, ah, ha, how did I get here? And it's because our brain is kind of trying to piece together the bits of dreams that we are getting into a co cohesive story. And that story is not cohesive because we are jumping here, there and everywhere. In astral projection, I will wake up and I will feel like I've not been asleep. Like I have been running all night or that I have been reading all night. And it's like that kind of, I wake up, but I haven't actually really been asleep. And usually I'm like ready to go. Like I'm like ready for the day. And not because I'm not tired, but mostly because I've not actually relaxed. I haven't got into that state because I've been like mentally working this entire time. And I won't have any jumps in what I am dreaming about. So there are no like separations between aspects of my sleep cycle. Instead, it is one strong, continuous thing with no jumps in it, one cohesive story that makes perfect sense. And sometimes I will encounter the same people in the same place doing completely different things. And that's when I know that I'm more in the astral than I am in dreams, especially because my dreams, people typically don't have faces, <laughs> which makes it really fairly easy for me to determine, but it is gonna be different for everyone. Okay, I do spirit boards connect with only ghosts or that can they connect with those that have crossed all the way over? So by all the way over, are we referring to people who have ended up say reincarnated or wherever it is that people think people go? Because spirit boards can commune with anything that is existing adjacent to us. So by that I mean they are not kind of reincarnated back again because otherwise they're gonna be people or animals or things again, depending on your belief system. We are communing with things that are spirits but are so close to us that they can interact with us. So we're talking about um, ghosts, we're talking about demons, fair folk, we're talking about um, nature spirits, things like this that can commune with us can come through in these kind of boards, though you are more likely to commune with demons, fair folk, and human spirits. Though please don't let the word demon scare the crap out of you. It usually is nowhere near as bad as people think. <laughs> and so these kind of entities can come through um, those kind of boards. If someone has already gone through their entire arc of wherever they go, we don't know, whatever it is, because they are no longer in the plane adjacent to us and able to interact with us, they are not gonna come through in a spirit board because it is about spirit boards, Ouija boards, pendulums, talking boards, however it is you wanna describe it and work with it. 
It is permitting a spirit to interact with you in the movement of an object, whether that is a pendulum, a glass, a planchette, whatever it is. And so they need to be able to have that energetic interaction. And if they can't have that because of your protections that you've got up or because of the fact that they aren't present in that space, you're not going to have um, an easy time with it. Do you have any suggestions for offerings for tree spirits and entities? We have an oak tree in our yard that protects the house and I would love to offer something. So I know that some people, quite a lot of people actually I think have answered this one in varying ways, but for me, when it comes to spirits, it is protection. And that protection can be in so many ways. It can be making sure that they're staying safe, make sure that nothing is gonna happen to them that's bad. If you can see that a part of their branch is rotting and it's starting to move up that branch and potentially into the trunk of that tree, while it might seem counterintuitive to chop off the limb, it's actually going to help protect that tree in the long run. So if they are protecting you, then offering some of that protection back is also really good, as well as time. I think, a lot of us, we will walk past a woodland or a tree and we will just walk past. And it's that mindset of, oh, the tree's still going to be there tomorrow, so I don't need to interact with them today. And I find a lot of the time, trees really appreciate someone stopping and interacting with them for a little bit. There's a tree that I do this to all the time. People must think I'm absolutely nuts. I will stop and have a conversation with her. <laughs> and I find that there is something so beautiful and peaceful in that moment and you might get information from them, such as their name, and also information that might help you to work with them even further and deepen that connection with them. So I do find time to be really, really useful. These pop-up ads are annoying. Unfortunately, the ads are how I pay to do this for four to five hours. <laughs> Electricity ain't cheap. And unfortunately, um, I, often need the ads to be able to pay the bills to make the videos. And I know that uh, YouTube has put in a new system where it is like putting ads at moments where it thinks are appropriate. I don't know if that is functioning. I don't know what's happening with it. But yeah, the ads, while I understand they can be frustrating, when people are content creators on YouTube, the ads literally pay for that content creator to keep making content. So I understand the frustration, but they are the only way that YouTube um, will continue on, unfortunately. Um, where was I? Here we go. What is your favorite part of practicing witchcraft? For me, it is the, the core way it has impacted my life, I think more than anything else, is that the way I perceive the world is different to how I perceive the world before or how other people I know perceive the world. And I really enjoy that aspect of it. I don't separate the magical world into just ritual time. For me, the magic of the world is everywhere. And when you can encounter spirits anywhere and feel the energy of place and experience kind of the living energy of the land around us, that is my favorite bit of it. And while that isn't inherently just a witchcraft related thing, it is something I find to be deeply ingrained in my practice. And it is my favorite bit. It's been able to go out into a sacred space and not just to know that it was sacred in the past or to learn about ancient peoples who worshiped there, for instance, at Stonehenge or significant sites like Newgrange or really anywhere that is significant in history. It is to be able to visit that place and understand fundamentally, energetically, what is so sacred and significant about that place. And it is a double-edged sword because you can go to a massive city or a site where horrible things have happened and you will feel that too. But for me, it is, uh, it's being so deeply rooted with the energy of the world that makes every little thing magical. And that, that, that's the thing, it's, it's the not losing the wonder for the world that is my favorite bit. And I'm sure that there are plenty of practitioners out there who do lose wonder for the world. But for me, that, that's just the bit that goes, ooh, <laughs> even if I've not practiced for a long time, or it's been weeks, even months, or you know, I've been ill and all this stuff. Instead, it's, 
it's that constant deep connection that no matter how far away I am from active ritual, it's still fundamentally there. Ooh, here we go. Kind of weird, but there's a building in my city that I can see in my dreams, as if it's trying to draw me in. More intense when I'm physically near to it. More intense when I'm physically near to it. What could that be? Spirits or energies? Honestly, perhaps it could be both. And it's... It's a difficult one because it's going to depend on kind of the history of that space, how sensitive you are to things, all that kind of stuff. And it is very much gonna vary. It could be that there is a spirit in that environment that is trying to connect with you because it knows that you are someone it can connect with. It might be a place of energetic significance. So it could be worth looking up some history of the site because you might find that there's something going on there that you may wanna focus on. And it's, it's very, very, <laughs> it's difficult to figure it out without knowing kind of what it feels like and also the, the place at hand. But it could be worth looking into the history of the building could also be worth looking into your previous experiences, perhaps previous lives. I know not everyone believes in past lives, but it could be something to look into in this just to see if there's any connection there because I know of people who have a deep intrinsic connection with a place and they have no idea why. And then when they started looking into past lives, they realized that, hang on a minute, <laughs> it's actually because I was here before and this is somewhere that I'd experienced and you might find that that is kind of reaching out to you in dreams which is where it is far more likely to reach out to you in because all of our protections are less protection-y while we are asleep especially like our like psychic defenses and so it may well be that that's something to look into too but definitely look into the history of the building because you might find even family member names like like uh, surnames might be coming through in the records of a building and then that might be the reason for that kind of connection. Wait, Yule logs can be eaten? <laughs> yeah, some, not all. So traditional Yule logs are made of wood. Um, and if they're not made of wood, in some places, in England especially, uh, you can buy Yule log cakes. It's essentially a chocolate roly-poly. <laughs> No one is gonna know what that is unless you're in England. It's like a roll of thin cake that has like buttercream or cream inside of it and it's rolled up into like a coil tube and then it's coated in icing that makes it look like a log. And then they stick like holly decorations and stuff on it. So you can use those for Yule and have like candles in it, kind of like a birthday cake and use it for ritual, especially for bringing in positive things. And then after all of your rituals, you can cut the cake up and spread it among like a coven and um, eat it. It's, it's a really effective way of doing a Yule log if you don't have access to a bonfire or kind of a, uh, well really any, anywhere you can burn a log, like it's not safe for everyone. So if you can get like a Yule log cake, they are great. Honestly, chocolate cake is just, it's just really, really good. I'm a sucker for chocolate cake. Right. Where was I? Da 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 da. Do 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 ba ba da ba ba da ba da ba ba da ba da Ooh, here we go. Can you give me a tip to manifest and focus as a beginner? Energy work. <laughs> Definitely energy work. It's, it is the biggest piece of advice I can give anyone who is just starting out is for the most successful manifestation and the most successful spells, rituals, anything like that, energy work is so, so useful. There's loads of videos on it online. There's loads of books on the subject. I have some videos on energy sensing and manipulation. There's books like Psychic Witch, which go into energy work as well. And it is just so powerful for really focusing in. And that is honestly kind of the biggest, the biggest tip I can give. It's not massively useful. It's not something that can be used straight away, I suppose, but it is something that I think sets the foundation for the um, long, for the long haul is what I was trying to say. But I, I read a question at the same time and then my brain went, I know what I'm gonna do. I'm gonna splice these two phrases together. I don't know if anyone else experiences that. <laughs> Maybe it's a dyslexic thing, I'm not sure. But I do it all the time where like I'm reading, 
and talking and then suddenly I start talking what I'm reading and it it becomes an absolute pain um ba -ba -da. right where am I I will do one more and then I'm gonna go to the bottom of the chat to uh, get the ones that I've missed Oh, here we go. I keep hearing different opinions about pendulum use. It's not spirit, it's a trickster, it's bias, therefore you can't trust it, etc. Do you have any insight on how to trust your pendulum or how to decipher it? So the whole it's a trickster thing is a, <laughs> not, no shade to TikTok, right? No shade to them at all. However, the whole thing of don't trust this, it's a trickster spirit has massively come in popularity since the rise of TikTok witchcraft. And TikTok witchcraft is fine. I mean, I it's you do you, I don't mind. But I find a lot of people now are coming out with the whole it must be a trickster, it must be a trickster. The reality is, is that trickster spirits are not all that common. Like, yes, they definitely do happen. And yes, you can definitely encounter them. But I find it strange that almost every single person who uses a pendulum on TikTok has found a thousand different trickster spirits. I find that really, really unusual. Not to discredit some of them, because I'm sure some of them have definitely experienced it, but I think there is quite a bit of fear-mongering going on. And understandably so, it can be a very stressful thing when we are just starting to um, work with pendulums, we aren't used to dealing with it. I can understand people being a little bit concerned. So when it comes to pendulums, there's two main ways of working with them in my experience. So the first is to work with your subconscious mind. So all of our little micro movements, which we do all day, every day, we don't realize that we're even doing them, they reflect how we are processing things in our subconscious mind. So you might have an intrinsic dislike to someone, or you might find that you get like a little shiver when you're next to someone that you really don't like. And this is our body's way of saying, hang on a minute, listen to me on this one. We don't like this person. You might not be knowing it like in your forefront of your mind, but we know it deep down that we don't like this person. This person's not good, stay away from them. And this kind of subconscious thing is what the pendulum is gonna amplify. So all of those micro movements that are happening all day, every day are magnified by the use of a pendulum. That's what makes it swing. And so we can essentially tell our subconscious mind or ask our subconscious mind which directions mean what in a pendulum and then ask questions. And sometimes those questions are gonna come from the subconscious. Sometimes it's gonna come from our psychic mind and our psychic understanding of the world. And it is going to kind of influence the way we swing that pendulum. Now, it's important that we try our best to not let our conscious mind influence it, which is incredibly difficult and it does take some practice and often when it happens, you can recognize when it happens. So if you've got really high stakes in something, your conscious mind goes, I want this to be a yes and therefore it becomes a yes. And you can often tell when this happens. I don't have a pendulum next to me, shocker for once. Um, I have a whisk, I'm not even joking. I actually have a whisk. Why? I don't know, but I have a whisk and I don't have a pendulum. Um, so when you are doing it with your subconscious mind, you'll often find that the pendulum is moving really, really small to start off with. And it will build up over time as you stay on that question, as the momentum of that weighted pendulum is going to swing backwards and forwards. And if we are then suddenly connecting with our conscious mind, it tends to go really strong. All of a sudden, it'll just swing in maybe the same direction, maybe in a completely different direction that will match what it is that you want to manifest. And so you'll often find, it's really obvious once, you rec once you've seen it once, you can kind of recognize it. When your conscious mind kicks in, all of a sudden the movements of that pendulum are gonna go really, really strong and they're always gonna align with what you want. So it's important to kind of take a step back and to maybe center yourself a little bit, ground yourself a little bit, maybe put on some music that's gonna really calm your mind and do some mind calming practices, just to try to set yourself into a more quiet, contemplative, 
um, kind of mindset before getting started if you do find that this has impact on it. Or you might wanna work with a different technique that you are not gonna influence. And this is the same for people who have um, shakes or people who have involuntary movements. You can rest your arm on something, so like rest your elbow on something to do it, or you can use a different technique that is going to remove the influence of shaking hands, involuntary movements, these kind of things. When we are working with it the other way, we are working with spirits. And this is where it gets a little bit trickier. So it's why this kind of practice isn't safe all of the time. And that's not to scare anyone because it it's not unsafe. It's just not as safe as working with only yourself. But you are essentially giving spirits permission to interact with you and they are going to influence your movements. And this can come through in many, many different ways. So one that can happen is someone will be holding a pendulum and all of a sudden they feel someone do this, like someone is holding their hand or holding their arm. And then all of a sudden the pendulum is behaving very differently than it was before. And that is that overlaying of energy, that spirit is coming in and they're like, oh, I'll take it from here this is mine now, we are gonna work together. And it's that overlaying that is significant. Another way of doing it is that it's the micro movement. So the spirit is interacting with you, but you won't feel anything here, but the pendulum will go from not moving at all. And when there is a spirit in that space that is interacting with it, you may find it starts to interact and move. You may also find when communicating with a spirit that the pendulum's answers are completely different to how they were before. So when you're reading for yourself, you might find that a clockwise turn is a yes and anti-clockwise means no. When a spirit comes in and with different spirits, you'll often find it's different, you may find that a no is a forwards backwards and a yes is a left and right and it's completely different to how you would normally read. So it's one where we can't rule out our influence. We, we simply can't because we are holding that object. Our minds are incredibly powerful things and we are holding something that we want to give us an answer. And that's why it's kind of useful to take a step back and say, okay, this is not going to negatively influence my life. If this answer isn't what I want it to be, I am not putting all of my stock, all of my eggs are not going in one basket, so to speak. I am still able to take a step back from that and go, okay, maybe this answer is not the be all end all of everything and that's okay. And that means that then our conscious mind isn't so hellbent on influencing it the way that it would if this was a life or death decision. You know, your, your conscious mind is going to try and overrule everything. Whereas if we are taking a step back and going, actually, this is not going to be the end of the world if I don't get the answer I want, our conscious mind can go, okay, I'll take a step back now. Now, when it comes to tricks to spirits, there's often this idea that every deity that comes through, every spirit that's coming through, every move of a pendulum is actually a tricks to spirit that's pretending to be something else in order to fool you. And we see tricks to spirits throughout the world in different traditions. I mean, a really popular one would be Loki. He is a tricks to God for many, among many other things. And yes, tricks to spirits do exist. Um, realistically, most people are not interesting enough for them to have any desire to interact with you. And if you are interesting enough, the best way of dealing with them is to ignore them. Because usually once they get bored and they realize you're not gonna have a reaction, they will then leave you alone and they'll just move on and do their own thing. Because what they want is that attention. They want you to be scared. They want you to jump. They want you to say something. And if you don't, they'll often be like, ah, never mind. I'll find someone else. And they'll just bugger off and find someone else. So they do happen but they are not as commonplace as some people um, believe that they are. And the thing is, is it's gonna be different everywhere you are. So in different areas around the world, they may well be in massive abundance. And I simply don't know because I live in England, but here we do not have that many. There are definitely some, but not too many that might be different elsewhere. It's gonna jump. Ah, oh, gosh darn, I knew it. I could tell. Okay, I apologize if I've missed any, but, um, oh no, I haven't, I haven't. Oh my goodness, okay, <laughs> it's fine. I recognize a question that I've already answered. Fantastic. <laughs> um, where was I? Uh, that means I'm somewhere around here. Um, ooh, ah, 
there it was pendulums okay question about moon water is it okay if my I, that mm, words are not my forte today is it okay if i leave my water on a windowsill without any moonlight shining on it yes will my water still charge yes and mostly this comes down to the way that the moon influences the earth. So the tides will still ebb and flow, even if the moon is covered by clouds, because the moon's influence on the earth is not limited to being able to see the moon or not. And so that energy is more permeating through the environment than it is blocked by clouds, for instance. I do, however, find that my water is stronger if it is under direct light, that doesn't necessarily mean that it is not functional, not useful, not usable, because it definitely is. And if you wanted to, you can stick your moon water out for the two nights either side of the date of the full moon and then supercharge it because then you've got three nights worth of moon charge instead of just one. So that's a good way around it if you do feel like it's not quite strong enough. But yeah, the moon will still influence either way. Is there a book that teaches you to read tarot in relation to spirits? Like what kind of spirits are coming through? Is it demonic, angelic or something else? Can you do a reading on hauntings and stuff? So as far as I know, there's no books on the subject, mostly because it's way too variable. And how you figure out who's interacting with you is going to depend on other cues as well. So if you have protections up, for instance, in your home or around you as an individual, it should be that unwanted spirits or spirits that mean you harm are kept away. Depending on how you've programmed your protections, they will be kept away. Then you can rule out the things that mean you harm. Everything else is something that is still a potential. And then you can go for other cues, like how your spirits are reacting, how you feel. Do you feel on edge? Do you feel unusual? Is there a smell in the space? Is the energy slightly different in that space? Figuring out who is coming through that way. And generally, you may also experience this kind of shift in energy as someone enters your space, someone touching you if they are kind of, if you're going through the cards and trying to figure out which one you want to pick for that spirit, you may well feel some kind of contact coming in from them as well. And it's it's more about other things than just the reading itself. Now, ideally, if you're going to be doing this kind of spirit tarot, I would recommend having some personal protections because they are kind of working through you. And in which case, it just makes sure that you're staying safe on their, like, on their behalf isn't the word I was after, but you're staying safe despite their interaction. And it also means that you're limiting who is going to be coming through. And you can also do readings on hauntings as well. So if you are in a space where, um, the, this is the way I, I do it. So I would lay out my cards on the floor. I would shuffle them with the intention of communing with spirits. So I would be in a space where they are present or where the activity is occurring. I will then take my deck, shuffle them however you want to shuffle them, lay them out on the floor, like spread them out everywhere. And then I will take a pendulum and I will say that I would like the spirit, if they would like to communicate with me, to communicate through that pendulum. The pendulum is then held over each card in turn. And when you get a reaction to that card, that is taken to one side. And you would do that until you've gone through all of the cards in that deck. However many, you might have one, you might have none, and that's fine. It just means that they don't want to interact with you. You might have 12. Turn them over, read them, figure out any relations that you might have from one to another. And it can give you some indication as to what's going on from that spirit's perspective. And it might give you some ideas as to how you can resolve that situation. You can, of course, just do readings yourself on a particular haunting or spirit activity. And that's going to come through with the energies that you're feeling around. Ancestor spirits might also want to help you, same with familiars, if they can assist you with that kind of reading. But that is one way of doing it, doing a tarot reading with the help of a spirit that is residing in that space. And that's if they want to communicate with you as well, because sometimes they just straight up don't. <laughs> Very long-term spell jars. Do you recommend refreshing them or leaving them untouched? Depends on the intention. So if I want to contain something, I would completely leave it. And if I wanted to add extra power to it, 
I wouldn't be opening it. I would be sticking a candle on top of it that was charged for my intention so that as it burns down, it kind of permeates around. I wouldn't be opening it though if it is something that is for containment. If it's something that is, for instance, like the manifestation of goals or some something where you want to build up energy over time and then you, you might want to work with that going forwards, you can open it, add more things in, recharge it again, close it again. It really depends on the kind of working that you're doing. For me though, if it's a jar spell, I typically just seal it stick it in the back of a cupboard and ignore it. But that's mostly because I will typically only do jar type spells when I want to limit something or contain it. And in which case I don't want to be messing with it, opening it, anything like that. I just want to leave it there to do its thing. And um, then maybe I'll reassess in like three months. I'll come back to it again, figure out what I want to do. Six months, figure it out and go from there. <laughs> What's the quickest and most efficient way to charge a spell and supercharge a spell? What is the best way to charge an amulet? I mean, ultimately it depends on what you want to work with. The most efficient way to charge a spell is to just get really, really good energy work. Because if you get really, really efficient energy work, it is so quick to do it. Energy work takes time when you're practicing that process. But once you get good at that process, it's really, really quick. If you want to supercharge something, you can use your own energy alongside the energy of something else that's very powerful. So this could be a particular cosmic event. So this could be something like a full moon. This could be like a comet. A series of shooting stars is a good one. Things like that can be really useful. Eclipses, solstices, even really, really powerful to add additional energy alongside your own. And then the best way to charge an amulet will be based on well, what you want to work with. So your own energy is fantastic for this. If you want to use the energy of something else, you can just make sure that it aligns with exactly what it is that you're looking for. Otherwise, you might find that it's only working in certain aspects of your life rather than all aspects because it's associated with a certain thing. So yeah, generally, the best way to charge anything is just to get really good at charging things. So, uh, I have this fear that something will latch onto me or try to attack me if I astral travel. Is this a valid concern? I find mixed information with research online. Okay, I'm gonna be really honest here. I have had kind of three bad experiences in the astral plane over the course of 18 years. Not bad odds, actually, and only on one occasion has anything ever followed me back. And that was my own mistake. So this is not something that I have experienced massively in all of my time, kind of, even accidentally astral projecting when I had no idea. So I don't think you need to be too worried about it because astral travel is very hard to get into and it's very easy to get out of again. So people often think that it's, it's like a, a, a nightmare where you're kind of stuck in a loop. And while you, you can be stuck in that situation, you aren't trapped there. So you can use that door if you want to leave from that space. You can walk away from a situation if you want to walk away from that situation. And usually, I don't think you're going to encounter anything strange. And if anything does startle you, you will typically snap straight out of it. And this is why astral travel is so hard to stick in for long periods of time, especially if you are particularly nervous. Doesn't mean you can't do it. Just means that you might find that you just bounce straight back into your body again when you get stressed, because that is kind of the default reaction is, oh, I don't like this, I'm going back. And even if you don't want to, you will literally just wake up. And so I wouldn't be too massively concerned about it. The only time I've ever had anything follow me back was when I essentially just walked back the way I came. General rule of thumb, if you're working with um, the dead, if you are going to graveyards, if you are working with unfamiliar spirits, don't go back the same way you came. Go kind of a convoluted way. Walk a different route back from the graveyard, you know, those kind of things. Same kind of applies in the astral. I, being the dumb dumb that I am, um, went the kind of walked just the same way back again. And I knew, I, I had this 
gut feeling, I knew that I was being followed. And I have a mirror facing my bed, which some people are gonna be like, oh my God, mirror facing the bed. I hadn't had a single problem with it. But then when I got back, I ended up with a spirit in my house. So I had to lock all of the mirrors to make sure that nothing came through again. And that was the only really bad experience I've had in 18 years. So it's not to say that nothing bad can ever happen. It is more that it is not going to be as common as you might think. And actually a lot of people's experiences in the astral is that there's nothing there. They, it's so vast and so expansive that you can be there and feel like you're completely by yourself or you can bump into a, a person that is also astral projecting or you might bump into a massive group of spirits and it's so varied. I don't think it's something to fear. And every experience that I've had in the astral that has potentially been seen as not positive, I'm still here. <laughs> I'm still here and I didn't have to do anything to fix it. Besides that one time I had to lock my mirrors, but that was on me, that was my fault. Um, otherwise, you might have uncomfortable experiences, but that's all it is. It's an uncomfortable experience. If you are ever in any real danger, you will pretty much just get snapped back. <laughs> and uh, end up in bed thinking, oh, God damn it, now I've got to go through that entire process again. So give it a try and just know that you are not going to be in that much danger. And if you want to feel even more comfortable, wear some kind of protective symbol, protective jewelry, have some kind of protection charm on you. A great one is to find or make a protection sigil. And if you can find an eyeliner pen, or even like a lipstick, a lip liner, something like that, draw that sigil on you before you try astral projecting. And that way you're even more protected if you don't have any other personal protections. So you're going in already prepared and that way you can kind of relax just a little bit into it. Right, where was I? I was here. Can you explain remote viewing and do you have any experiences you can share with us if you've done it? Thank you. So remote viewing is some people consider it the same as astral projection. I actually don't consider it the same as astral projection. To me, it, it's intrinsically different in that in astral projection, my spiritual form is going to the astral plane. Whereas in remote viewing, it is viewing somewhere that you are not while you are still here. <laughs> Does that make sense? So it's essentially, there's a locked room in front of you and you can drop into a state enough that you are able to essentially experience what is inside that room without ever going inside that room. And it was actually for a long time um, looked into by the, I forget which government it was, um, one of them. During the Second World War, basically, we were looking into remote viewing it was like this big thing where people were like, we want to get out trade secrets. We want to know what's happening. Let's look into remote viewing, the ability to see somewhere that you are not. It's almost like the first step in astral projection. So it's not full blown astral projection. It's enough though, so that you can perceive things that are happening around you when you are not yourself being seen. And it's a really interesting concept and it allows us to gain knowledge, gain information from other places without having to visit ourselves. And it is usually, at least in my experience, kind of an easier step to astral projection. Full astral projection is kind of really tricky and it takes a lot of kind of perseverance to stay there long enough. Whereas remote viewing is maybe a little bit more of like a first step into it. It is the, the dipping of toes into astral projection. So we're honestly really interesting. Um, the entire, I, I need to look way more into it actually, the whole, everything that happened during the second world war was mad. So we had so much like, so many different countries looking into occultism and how it can benefit them. You also have the 
um, coven of witches, Gerald Gardner, who cast the giant cone of power to assist in protecting against German invasion, which I think is really cool. And then you had remote viewing being funded, and it was it was so such an interesting and also really horrible point in history that I definitely feel like I need to look more into. And uh, someone said in relation to um, astral projection that Ivy the Occultist how she, uh, that takes a servitor with her every time she astral travels and that is a really great way of doing it and will thoroughly recommend if you have the desire to, the means to, if you would like to make a servitor, you can make them specifically for protection and then they can go everywhere with you and also into the astral plane, which would be honestly really effective if you are nervous about astral travel. You have that first spiritual line of defense, which is really useful. This also applies to familiars. If you do have a spirit familiar, they are also going to be really useful and they may perhaps be able to guide you slightly easier because they are more well-versed in the spiritual plane than a servitor that is brand new will, will know the spiritual plane. So, where was I? I was... Uh, somewhere around here. Somewhere? Kind of around here, maybe? <laughs> any advice on how to deal with a deity who refuses to accept any boundaries I set? I've been a witch a long time, but because they have a deity, my usual techniques seem wrong. I've confirmed with tarot. Okay, so it's a deity that refuses to set boundaries. This is really interesting. I suppose it could be worth looking into folklore and mythology surrounding said deity as to whether there are any strict protocols that have traditionally been followed. Perhaps there is something that has gotten lost along the way that is really important for them. You know, a set series of rituals that have been used for both in and out of rituals. And so without it, they are not accepting anything else that could be worth looking into. It's very unusual to find a deity like this, so I'm expecting there's going to be something like that working in the background to kind of fuel this along. It's very interesting, actually. I'm going to have to look more into this. I'm unfortunately not going to be able to give you a massive bunch of help on this, because that's the only thing I can think of right off the bat that is going to be a trigger for this, because I have known of a few not even just deities, but also spirits, usually spirits, honestly, more than deities, that if their set ritual protocol isn't followed, they straight up just do not listen. And it, it's usually found in ceremonial magic, I find, when people are, like, playing around with it and they don't realise that, like, a specific higher demon requires certain invocations and certain offerings and they will not accept anything less, that they get themselves into trouble, but very rarely with deities. So I'm wondering if there's something that's kind of gotten lost along the way, maybe. Unfortunately, I'm not going to be much help on this one, but I would be really interested in learning if you ever figure out kind of the reasoning for this or the way around it. That would be really good to know just to help anyone else. Oh my goodness! Cauldron Born, is it your birthday today? If it is, happy birthday. <laughs> I hope you have an amazing day. What a day to have a birthday, the day before the winter solstice, that's cool. Um, how do I connect with Saint Cyprian? Cyprian? I am not a saint person, I'm afraid. But generally speaking, I'd say look into mythology and folklore, look into legends and stories, and see if you can find the things that are associated with, that they connect with, that they work over, because a lot of saints do obviously have like very set aspects of life that they will um, kind of oversee. And then have a look if there's anything there that you can do to offer help to certain aspects of life. I think that could be a really good way of doing it. I would, however, recommend getting in touch with someone who does work closely with the saints and see if you can figure out things that they work with. Maybe for all saints, maybe they have some things that they use to connect with all saints and then they will tailor it specifically. I think that's probably going to be really useful. But because I don't work with the saints, I'm not going to be particularly good at specific ones because um, I... I don't, I don't do saint work. It's nothing wrong with it. It's just not for me. So um, fingers crossed you can figure out uh, what you're doing with that. Or what to do with that, should I say. Right. Go. 
How do you feel about doing spells as gifts? Do you have any recommendations of spells to do for loved ones that can be gifted? Oh, I like this question. So yeah, there's, there's definitely people in our lives that I think would prefer, I mean, not everyone, obviously, but especially people who are very in tune with spirituality, maybe they get you and they understand what you do, that would probably prefer some additional spiritual help over a random gift that will probably end up never read or never used or whatnot. And so I think there's definitely something about gifting a really beautiful piece that has some symbolic value, energy, those kind of things to it. So there's definitely a few options out there. So you have little bags that you can do really beautifully. You can also gift, for instance, a piece of jewellery that has been charged and enchanted, perhaps a locket that contains herbs and items of significance that you can give to them and they can wear it not only as a beautiful piece of jewellery, but also as a practical spell work item. And these kind of things are are really, really sweet. There's also, it it's going to depend on what they're interested in, of course, because some people are gonna more align with some things than other things, but you can give, on my last video, um, on the altar, I have some little bottles and one of them is a bottle that is designed to they're very decorative bottles, but it's a tree spirit bottle. And for me, it's got the birch bark on it. And this is something that I will go on to work with alongside tree spirits and add their energy into the bottle along with some items that represent them. So then they, I can add it then later into spell work and ritual. And something like that could be really nice for someone who is interested in it, dipping their toes into it. Things like that, that can be used very practically, but they're also very beautiful. So focus points for things, enchanted jewelry, bags that have been charged with intention, spell bottles can be really good. This time of year, it's really great to do like witch balls, which are just really beautifully decorative. You can get them from lots of places or you can make them yourself. They make really good gifts because they're really beautiful, but they're also really practical and they have that kind of twofold nature. So anything like that could be really nice to give as a gift. Curious, is there any such thing as a Christmas witch? I've got to say, I've never heard of a Christmas witch. Um, they may well exist out there and I'm sure they do, but I've never heard of them. Mostly because a lot of witches, but not all, uh, don't work with Christmas as it is seen today. They will connect with something else. Some do work with Christmas, but certainly not all. And it's a very limited niche. So for instance, Green Witch, Hearth Witch, Hedge Witch, Cosmic Witch. These are all titles to describe our style of practice to another practitioner. But within each of those styles, there's so much variety there that means the practice is not one dimensional, it's very dynamic, it's adaptive. Whereas I do wonder if a Christmas witch is perhaps a little bit too limited to have long-term viability. It's not to say it can't be done, but to only be able to do magic around one very brief period of the year, around certain traditions might be a little bit limiting. You'll probably find people who are seasonal witches, who will work with the energy of the seasons as their primary focus for their spells and rituals. But I do wonder if Christmas witches may be just a little, just a smidge too specific. Um, but who knows? I'm sure that there definitely are people out there. Any recommendations on Audible books? I have a few that I'm reading. If you would like me to do a full video on my recommendations for Audible books, do let me know. Most books that I enjoy that are modern books are also available on Audible, usually for um, a fee, like a token, or they're just you know able to buy outright. But I have been working through some books that are part of the membership. So what you already pay, they are included, which I find really interesting. My favorite right now, I actually just did a review of it on Patreon, is, uh, oh my goodness, what is his name? Buckland, sorry, I've got his other book there. Raymond Buckland's Guide to Spirit Communication is really, really good, thoroughly enjoyed it. It's not gonna be for everyone, but that was really enjoyable for me and that was free. So definitely gave that one a read. And I think Hedge Witch by Ray Beth is also free. Um, that was also 
Very good read. Not about hedge witchcraft, though. It is about solitary wicker. Just bear that in mind. It's just a different term that's been used for it. But there's so much out there. One thing I will warn against, and um, please be careful with this, is that as of a few weeks ago, maybe a, maybe a month or so ago now, they've permitted the use of AI-generated narration. A robot is basically reading you a book and you are paying the same amount for it. So if you can, please make sure that if you're getting a book off Audible, that you are supporting the people who are creating it, for one, and you're also supporting the very hardworking audio narration because that takes a lot of time. It's not easy to read a book and get it right. So if you can find books that specifically tell you that there's like a name of the narrator, they are the ones that I would recommend supporting. Of course, you can just completely ignore me entirely. Those are the ones that I'm only going to be supporting. I'm not paying to have a computer read to me and take the job of someone who's worked really hard to be an audiobook narrator. So with that being said, I will probably make um, videos going forwards about kind of at least one video about my favorite books that I've read like in the past year on Audible that are included in the membership because I think that could be good. Not everyone has the budget to have like a massive collection of books. And if you've got an Audible subscription, that could be a great way of doing it. Okay, next up, <laughs> where was I? I am here somewhere. Oh, I don't think I said, th I'm so sorry. Brittany, thank you so, so much. I'm so sorry. I did not see this when it came in, but thank you so, so much for all of your support. Oh no, I need to get better at checking when things come in. Oh dear. Any recent book recommendations? I, I, okay. I just got back from Glastonbury. By just, I mean like a week ago. And I got Lots of new books, as I always do. I'm unsure, though, whether to do a book video again or whether it's just too many. Let me know, would you like to see the books that I got from Glastonbury this year to give you some ideas of books that you might want to look out for? Or are you not interested? Do let me know when I'm going to go with whatever people would prefer on that one. But I got quite a few that look really interesting. I've started reading them, but at the minute, my, my book recommendation is um, Traditional Witchcraft by Gemma Gary, A Cornish Book of Ways. I've read it before um, and I've been rereading them all in preparation for this video that I'm doing in a few weeks. And so that one, I'm just, oh, it's beautiful. I love it. I love the pictures. I love getting to see all of the details in it. I find it really, really enjoyable. So that is my current book recommendation. If you've not already read it, I would recommend checking it out if you can. I know that the prices of it online are absolutely crazy, which is bananas to me because it's a, it's a still in print book. It should not be that expensive, but um, yeah, that is um, one that you might want to check out. My chat just jumped again. Oh no. <laughs> Um, so yeah, um, we've got yes book video, yes book video, yes book video, yes book video. Please show us the books purchased. Okay, so I'll do that before I put them away then because I'm, um, I was gonna put them all in my bookshelf and now I'm like, I probably shouldn't do that. So I'll film that video probably af just after Christmas um, to go up in January to give you some ideas because um, everyone wants a new start in January of things that they might want to get practices and traditions they might want to go into. So I will set that up for in January at some point. Okay, where was I? I was here somewhere. Um, doo -doo -doo. This one confuses me because I don't understand the wording of it. Out of curiosity, what's the deal with Yuletide magic? I don't understand the wording of that. What's the deal? What does what's the deal mean? Am I, am I being clueless? I think I'm being clueless. What's the deal? I don't... I'm confused. Um, Yuletide magic is essentially, I don't really understand the question, but that's just me being clueless, um, is essentially just magic that is done for the Yule season. So like specific spells and rituals that you might want to carry out specifically because of the energy of that season. It's a bit like people have say, it's a bit like ha people how say, it's uh, Yoda, am I okay? Um, it's a little bit like how people say um, Samhain magic or Letha magic, Mabon magic. It's just magic to harness a particular seasonal energy. And that's just the term that is used. I think that might be the answer to that question. It's like, what's up with that? I don't even really understand that either. I'm very bad with anything that isn't like to the point. Um, I, I think I answered the question, I hope so. <laughs> I really hope so, but yeah. Um, 
basically that it's just a descriptive term and they're often used on social media to kind of allow people to specifically know what it is that you're referring to. Could I make artwork as an offering? Oh, definitely. Yes, definitely. Um, ba -ba -dum, ba -ba -dum. What video of yours discusses how to cleanse my home without banishing good spirits and energies? I want to put protections in place, but not disturb the extras in my home that haven't been harmful. Oh, um, you would, I don't specifically have a video on how to do that per se, because it's going to vary based on your protection method. But when it comes to cleansing, it's, um, I mean, cleansing is not going to banish anything. Um, it, it's just going to disrupt that energy so you can then get rid of it out of your space. So what I will do is if I'm going to cleanse a room, which I do very rarely, I will knock on the walls of my house and I will essentially tell the spirits that if they don't want to be influenced by what I'm doing in this room, please go to a different room temporarily. I will then do the cleansing. Once I'm done with the cleansing, I'll knock on the walls again. There's actually a big wooden panel, not panel, but it's like a, it's like a door frame that's like this big. I'll knock on that when I'm about to start, let them know what's happening. When I'm done with it, I'll knock on it again to know that they are free to come back into that space again. When it comes to protections, protections will typically only limit things that are coming in, not things that are going out. So if something is already in, if they've not been disturbed by the cleansing because they've been in a different area, they won't be impacted or they shouldn't be impacted by that protection unless they leave and then come back in again. But with all of my protections anyway, I put a kind of like an energetic caveat in that so that any protections on my property are for spirits that are of negative intention or wish me harm. Same with energy. So it doesn't keep all, out all energies and it doesn't keep out all spirits. It keeps out all spirits and energies that mean me harm or have negative goals. And therefore that limits kind of the negative influence it has on spirits that are already within my home. And I hope that is useful. How you do that is gonna vary on how you set up your, um, your protections in particular, but that's just how I do it. Someone said, I think these are American phrases. I've, re I've realized I really struggle with American turns of phrase because they, they vary so much place to place. And I'll be watching a video and I'll be like, what, what is that? And then someone in the comments will be like, oh, it's, it's this. And I'm like, oh, it's, I, I watched a video of an Instagram reel actually, that was like noughts and crosses in the snow. And every American was like, what is noughts and crosses? It's tic-tac-toe. I'm like, what the fuck is tic-tac-toe? It's noughts and crosses. <laughs> like, I have to have it very specifically explained to me. Otherwise, I do not know what is happening. So, let's have a look. How do you feel that magic and witches are portrayed and depicted in comic books? I mean, it's the same with all media. I have a series running of, like, witchcraft in like real witchcraft in movies and like the little bits that they've drawn on to make the characters fit in the real world before they kind of add all of the extra magic the like tv and movie extras onto it to make it not realistic and as far as i'm concerned i think when it comes to things that are fantasy based i don't actually mind how things get portrayed too much so I, I'm perfectly accepting that if it's a movie, a TV show, a comic book, even a book that is fantasy, to me it doesn't really matter how that is being portrayed because it is just a fantasy world. And that's that's generally how, um, how I think of it. The only time I have issues with it is when we are looking at shows, TVs, shows tvs am i okay M movies and tv shows as well as books and comics and stuff that are based on real life situations you know real people from history real events like the salem witch trials the pendle witch trials all of these things and then they add a bunch of nonsense onto it that makes what happened seem valid justified that makes witchcraft seem like a joke and that none of this is actually bad and it's funny and that's the only time I have a problem with it is when I mean Salem kind of walks that line with me that the tv show I think it's called Salem anyway that kind of walks the line for me because people are definitely portrayed in ways that the Christians wrote about that wasn't actually true otherwise I'm not that fast so it, it does definitely depend. And if it's a documentary, 
if they come at me with any of this nonsense, I will not watch it or read it or anything because it just, it just bothers me. Ah, okay. What the deal means, can you explain? Thank you so much. I now, I will now know that. So what, what's the deal and what's up? Can you explain? Fantastic. I like, I like, it's like having a translation app. I, I need it because sometimes it's the same language technically, but there's just so many like individual wording differences. Has anything happened, has anything scary happened to you when summoning spirits? So I don't summon spirits. Um, for me, I only work with the spirits that are in the space or present in the environment and I will leave everything else well alone. That's not to say that anything bad will come from it or anything like that, but it is just something you've got to be cautious of and you've got to be prepared that if that spirit enters into your space that you are able to also get rid of that. And that isn't always the easiest thing to do. So... I don't summon, I only work with, but no shade to anyone who does summon, as long as you're doing it safely, that is fine, as long as you're not like harming the spirit in the way and along the way and like bothering them, that's not great. Um, let's see, where am I? Oh, okay, it's not just me then. <laughs> so this is something I've also experienced that, so, that word, words. <laughs> does anyone else watch Evan and Caitlin? If you haven't, they're a craft channel on YouTube. I love craft channels. And they have a shirt that says words are hard. And today of all days, I feel that shirt more than any other time. <laughs> so said Hearth or anyone else in the chat. I've noticed lately that ravens or crows always cross my path. I've had them in my dreams too. What does this mean or is it a message? Now, obviously I, I don't know where you are in the world, but this is pretty commonplace at this time of year. We see it a lot. I've experienced it myself and I experience it every single year at this time of year. And so it may well be that you're simply noticing natural cycles, natural behavior that you are simply paying more attention to in case it is a sign. And then the more you see something in real life, the more likely it is to appear in your subconscious. So that might be something that's trickling over. It might be that it's worth looking into, as I believe other people have mentioned, um, figures and deities that are associated with these birds, such as the Morrigan, potentially Odin as well, figures like this that might help. And you might experience other things in your life that are also lining up to these deities as well. But it could also just be a seasonal change, as it is for me here. At least I think it is for me here. Otherwise, we both got some weird stuff going on. <laughs> How do you know if you've seen a ghost? I think I saw one, but it wasn't a full body apparition. It looked like a concentrated mist and didn't disappear right away. So for me, I, it's going to depend on your environment, of course. But my big thing is if I can rule out other sources of that imagery or whatever it is I'm experiencing, then that leaves me with a question of, have I suddenly started hallucinating despite the fact I've never had this happen at any other point in my entire life throughout history? Or have I seen something unusual? And it can be really difficult to discern things when you're by yourself, which is why I've been incredibly lucky in that so many of my experiences have been with other people. And that's not just human ghosts, that is also demons, that is nature spirits, that is fair folk. So many of my experiences have been with someone else very lucky for me because then I can be like, did I actually see that? And someone else will go, yeah, you did. And that is a very grounding experience of, okay, I can't just brush this off as being my imagination because other people have seen this too. Now, my main thing is, can it be something else? So if you see a moving shadow, I had to do this a few months ago now. I was at a, an abandoned, you were allowed to go in. It was an abandoned stately home that was open to the public. <laughs> and in the basement, it was really, really creepy. You've got like room on room on room on room. And so you've got almost got like corridors of rooms going off this giant basement. And I was in one room and all of the lights were around the edge of the room and we were standing in the doorway. And so it really creeped me out when I saw a shadow walk across the room, except I debunked this in that no one else was there with us. 
we were both stationary and there was no way that we could have made a shadow because the lights were in front of us, not behind us. And so I went through that process of like ruling everything out. And that is something I find to be really useful when you are coming across these kind of things is if you are wondering if it's a ghost or not, try to rule things out. If you've seen a shadow, is there anything that could be causing that shadow? If you've seen a mist, is there realistically any reason why there would be a mist, say, in your room? Is there anything that could be causing it? And it might be a time then to go, okay, it might be. And I think that's the big step is you don't have to go from this isn't a ghost to this is definitely a ghost. You can sit somewhere in the middle of that was weird. <laughs> I don't know what that was, but I can't debunk it. And I don't know what it was. I don't necessarily want to say it was a ghost, but it was definitely something weird. And so that is something you can do as well and write down all of your experiences because you might find that in a year, two years, you might find you have the same experience again in the same place and you would have forgotten about it if you hadn't wrote it down. If you hadn't wrote, if you hadn't written, if you hadn't written it down. Um, so I have like a book where I write all of like my strange encounters so that I have a date and a location and I know exactly what happened the day it happened. Because the problem with memory is we remember the last time we remembered. And so you end up with memories that shift and adapt over time. Whereas if you write it down the day it happens, even if you recall it incorrectly time and time and time again, you have a written record of what you experienced. And so you know exactly what it was instead of what you remember it being in like 10 years time. Okay. I don't know why I've got that song in my head again. Any music recommendations? That is an, a good timing for that. I have quite a few playlists on Spotify. So I'll see if I can put the link in somewhere. Um, this is my like, Hearthwitch Spotify account, not my personal Spotify account, but maybe if you are interested in learning about the music that I listen to, 99 times out of 100, I will maybe make a, a playlist of just my casual everyday music. If you want kind of witchy, pagany, seasonal music, because I have lots of seasonal Sabbath playlists on there as well, um, they're on there. So I have like a Yule playlist, an Involve playlist, all that kind of stuff. Some of them are a little bit sparse, but the Yule one I think has got quite a lot in it. So um, I'll try and link that somewhere if I can figure out how to do it. Um, I might have to go for an explore on my different videos and see if I can find it. Let's see, um, Yule. I'm pretty certain that it was on my previous Yule video, but let's find out, shall we? Uh, no, it's not on that video. Where did I put it then? I definitely did a playlist somewhere and like linked it. Anyway, if I can't find it now, I will have to find it after the stream and I'll like put it in the description box or I'll post it on like Instagram or something so that you can check that out. But that is the music that I listen to during spells and rituals, during Sabbath celebrations. And then I'll probably make a separate playlist. I will warn you, my, my music taste is um, interesting in that I go from damn the bard, um, like, cute, sweet, classical music when I'm doing spell work and ritual to sleep token in about 4.5 seconds. And that is how it, <laughs> it splits. It is rock, punk rock, metal, pop rock to folk music. <laughs> there is very little in between, so be braced for that, but I'll have to make like a, a playlist that I can keep updating. Okay. Do, do, do. What witchy sites and stores would you recommend in Wales? We've been to Devon and Cornwall, love Tintagel, Happy Yule from Alabama. Unfortunately, I don't know the rest of Wales all that well. I only know North Wales. And even in North Wales, a lot of the witchy stores I used to go to have since closed down. So maybe what I need to do on my journeys around, because you guys know if you follow me on Instagram, I love traveling to places. Um, I will have to see if I can find some interesting little shops that I can recommend um, and see if I can do that because I've not been to North Wales in a very long time and I really want to go back again. And I've never, I've been to Mid Wales, I've never been to South Wales. So that's somewhere I want to go as well and kind of explore and see what it's all like. Um, Cause North Wales I love and same with Mid Wales, I've just never gone South. So we'll have to, we'll have to go on a journey there. Actually, 
I have a vlog. <laughs> I haven't edited said vlog. I was meant to have posted it this week and then I realised, oh no, it's getting really close to um, live stream time of my trip down to Glastonbury and all the historical sites that I've been to. So I don't know where I'm going to post that. It might be on here, it might be on Patreon. It depends on how many people want it on here, I suppose. So I'm going to do that. And anytime I go somewhere, I'm going to try to make a vlog of the different interesting sites because I've got so many comments from people and so many DMs of people in America especially saying that they're making a trip to the UK, can you give us some interesting places to visit? So I feel like they might be useful for that. <laughs> I don't know. But um, yeah, that I'll have to, if I ever go to North Wales again, um, which I will obviously, but I'll have to properly look around and see if I can find loads of cute little witchy shops and see which ones I recommend and which ones I don't. Though honestly, I love supporting them all. So that would be kind of, it would be difficult for me to say that I don't like them because I would love them all, but some are definitely better than others. Okay. Could you explain the witch ideology in a few words? Honestly, that one is really, really difficult because every witch is going to have completely different beliefs, thought processes, religious backing, reasons for ideas. There's literally so much that goes behind it and witchcraft is not one thing to one person so it's no witchcraft is not one thing to everyone it is one thing to one person so what i practice in my craft is not going to be the same as what half of the people watching the stream are going to be practicing we're all going to be working in completely different ways and so while i might be able to express my ideology behind it that's not going to apply to everyone else. And so it's a very difficult one to summarize at all, let alone in, you know, just a few brief sentences. I need to figure out where I am. Oh my goodness, I'm not sure I've seen any of, th did I? I'm not sure I've seen any of, oh, I'm so sorry. I don't think I saw this one. Thank you so much to Pam, and thank you s I can't remember if I've said half of these. I'm so sorry. I don't think I've said Pam, so thank you so, so much to Pam, and thank you so much to Betania, if I haven't. Thank you. I need to be better at keeping on track of the super chats when they come in, because I keep losing them. Do you have any tips for getting over blockages? I often can't help but doubt my abilities or sometimes even my practice itself, which causes my spells to fail, which then causes me more doubt and so on. When it comes to something like this, and it might be useful, it might not, but the way I think of it is it doesn't really matter whether or not my practice is magical, whether my practice is spiritual, whether my practice is placebo or self-care. It really doesn't matter because at the end of the day, if I feel better carrying out my practice, even if that just means that I feel more focused on a particular goal that I want to achieve and I'm directing my time and effort and energy into that, that to me is equally as powerful as it being a magical, spiritual, energetic response. They are different, but ultimately, if it is of benefit to our lives, it doesn't really matter where it's come from. If all that spell and ritual does is focus your mind to achieve something you've always wanted to achieve, and it gives you the push to be able to achieve it, that to me is just as effective. It is powerful. It's done its job. It might not have done its job magically, but it's done its job psychologically. And that is just as valid. And the, that's kind of how I've always framed it in that ultimately, if someone told me tomorrow that there's evidence that witchcraft doesn't work and this, that and the other, I still know that it has a positive influence on my life. Simply the ritual action of carrying out things to focus my intention is incredibly useful to me. And so I would continue doing those actions anyway, because regardless of a magical response, that's still useful. And it takes away that kind of mindset of either it is 100% this or it is nothing. I find that that kind of strong black and white thinking is not really useful to me as someone with a whole bunch of other 
like OCD and anxiety and stuff, I don't find black and white thinking to be very useful. And so I apply the same thought process into my magic as well. So whether that helps you, I don't know, but that's how, um, that's how I've always done it. <laughs> Any thoughts on going into trance or trance work? Would you advise it as a method to connect with spirits, deities, and other entities? Any tips on how to do it safely? Yeah, trance work is absolutely phenomenal. There's so, so many ways of doing it. And ultimately, it's going to depend on what you feel comfortable with. Trance can vary in intensity from something where you'd want a group of people around you for safety to things that you can do yourself with just mild trance work. You don't have to dive straight into really intense trance if you don't want to. So some examples that are really commonly found here would be something like treading the mill. That is a form of trance work. So, so is um, walking a labyrinth that's a form of trance work, or even tracing a labyrinth. You'll often see in occult shops in the UK, these like slate sheets with a labyrinth carved into them. And you essentially are dropping yourself into trance by repeatedly following the labyrinth with your finger and tracing it out. You can do this with a, a sheet like that and um, something textural, preferably. You can make one yourself out of clay if that's what you want to do. Um, or walking a labyrinth is really useful as well. You can also listen to certain types of music. I know that drum beats are really effective, especially drum beats that are in tune with your heart and then they slow and slow and slow down to help drop us into that state. Dance can often help with trance, just like even just dancing to music you like. If you like sleep token, then just dance to sleep token and just allow the words to just kind of wash over you. Like they have no meaning. It's all about that movement, that fluidity. That can help. Even staring into something that really captivates your senses, like a flowing stream, the sound and the sight of it can really help you disconnect and drop into that almost trance state where time doesn't have any meaning. And that might sound really scary, but a lot of them can be really easily snapped out of. You don't have to go really, really intense. I think when people think trance work, they think very, very deep trance that requires safety measures. And while you might want to include that if you're just getting started in it, just gentle trances can be really useful, especially if you're struggling with mind calming. If you're struggling to get into the right headspace for spells and rituals and divination, it can be really useful. I will often literally just stare into a candle flame with some repetitive music. And that music doesn't have to be anything unusual. For me, there's a few pieces of music on my playlist actually that I will just have on in a loop. And they are just really, really nice, relaxing, repetitive pieces of music. And those ones will just play on a loop while I'm looking into a candle flame. And that's just a really effective way for me to just drop into almost a half trance. I could take it further, but it's definitely something that you can do in a mild, gentle way just to ease yourself into it. I resonate so much with that it works for me, so I don't care if it's real or not and refuse black and white. Thinking because of OCD, I've never felt more seen. Oh, I'm so glad because I felt the exact same. Like I I did not realize I had, I, I didn't realize that other people didn't think the same way I did <laughs> until I realized that other people did. And it, it it's definitely that black and white the black and white thinking with ev anything and everything, I don't think is great for people who do struggle with things like that because you can definitely take it to the extremes and that's not, extremes of anything is not healthy. Moderation is definitely the key, even with kind of thinking and thought processes, black and white thinking is definitely a slippery slope <laughs> if you do struggle with that kind of thing. Right. <laughs> As a fellow witch working with Bridget, are there some tips that you suggest that aren't in your video? I'll be honest, I don't remember what I said in my video because I did it so long ago. Actually, when did I do that video? Good question. I don't actually know. I'm curious now. When did I film this video? Oh, I filmed that one in 2020, but that's not the one I'm after. Anyway, um, 
mostly for me it is little simple things so i will give an offering over seven days usually a tea light candle something like that that has been anointed with oil and it will be a different tea light candle every day for seven days and that's how i've formed that connection if i would like her help with manifesting something or protecting something then it is a petition on her altar which is just over over there you can't see it. it's behind the glowing section right here <laughs> that is a filming light um my bridget altar is just there i leave a little petition inside a goddess figure and then i burn seven tea lights over seven days and that's how i do that i also have bridget oil bridget incense things that I resonate with that go on that altar in relation to her. And that's primarily how we work on an as needed kind of basis, but the altar is always set up. So it's not so much a tip, but it is just something that, that's just the way I typically um, work that. How would you recommend cleansing a room with no window? Our main bathroom has stagnant heavy energy and sits at the end of a narrow hallway. Is there anything at the end of the hallway? As in, is there anything along the way? Because I'm surprised, a bathroom with no window? That's quite unusual. Um, the thing with cleansing is cleansing doesn't actually remove. It disrupts and it like irritates, agitates, dissipates that energy. So when you cleanse, you shake that energy all up in that space and then you would open windows and doors to allow that shaken up, disrupted energy to then be drawn outside again. So if you can, maybe cleanse from the back of the bathroom forwards out of the bathroom along the corridor and towards a door, a window, something that it can exit through and do it that way. Because to cleanse without removing it, you shake everything up and then once you're done, it all settles back down again. So really you need to be driving some flow into that. And whether that is literally starting at the back of that bathroom and literally walking all the way down that corridor with whatever technique you use, whether it is smashing pans together, whether that is burning different kinds of herbs depending on your tradition, whatever it is, just to really draw that energy along that corridor and out is probably going to be the best option. Yeah, I've never seen a bathroom with no window, but like they, they definitely exist, clearly. People are saying that they exist. I've just never, yeah, that's strange to me. But yeah, if you can drive it towards some kind of opening a window door, anything like that, even a vent, like even a um, extractor van. Actually, that's a good point. If your bathroom has an extractor van, which I would hope it would, you can use the extractor fan. As long as the extractor fan is on, it is drawing the air outside. So you can use that as a way of doing it as well. How's my little tea light doing? It's doing okay. We're fine for now. Right, where was I? I was here. Um, I'm very new to the craft and have what I consider to be an altar. Am I meant to be setting up an individual altar to each deity or can I use a general one? Ultimately, you don't need to have any kind of altar if you don't want one. And you don't have to for any deity um, necessarily. So if you would like deity spaces, you are going to have to ask them because some deities are not gonna work well together based off their own history, their own energy, and sometimes they simply don't feel comfortable working with another deity. And so it's important to really ask whether or not they're comfortable with that or not. If they are, you can have little spaces on a main altar. You can have, as mentioned earlier, digital altars, temporary spaces. You can set up a space briefly for deities and then take it down again after that working is done. All of that is an option, but they definitely aren't a requirement unless you feel like you really want or need them. Da, da, da. Right. I'm somewhere here. I don't know where I was. Oh, here. Okay, this is not. I mean, it is it a question? No, it is a question. Yeah. Sorry, I wasn't reading it properly. Um, thank you so much to Sydney. Oh, I love your name. Thank you so much. I've always loved the name Sydney. It's such a beautiful name. Hi, Hearth. A ritual or working for a couple to do together. Thanks for all your work. So when it comes to couple work, it's usually on something that is a collective interest 
or I mean they can be um, included in a working to assist with raising that energy but usually it is for a collective goal so that could be amplifying the love or the connection within a relationship improved finances that could be improved protection or protection for a space and actually a couple can be really good at creating protection jewelry, protection charms, because actually protection anything, anything that you can do for enchanting is really good with a group. So let's say you wanted to enchant an object to help bring more money into your home. Let's say that. So you have got, say, like a, a sigil on a piece of paper that you are going to attach to the computer or something for more money. You would sit or stand together with the charm that you've created in the middle of you and you're going to want to connect hands on either side of it or you know whatever you can so you are essentially creating a circle like a, a connection circle and you can do this with more than two people so basically all you need is for everyone to be connected to one another so you are creating a continuous loop this is going to make up the edge of your circle essentially. So you are going to be funneling energy kind of around between one another, collecting everyone's energy, and then you're going to be kind of spiraling it into the center of that circle into the charm that you have created that you want to charge. This is especially useful if everyone that is doing this has an interest in what you're doing. So if everyone is going to benefit, so you can do this for a family, you can do this for a coven, you can do this for just a relationship, whether it's just two people, whether it's a polyamorous relationship, whatever it is that you are working with, if everyone has a vested interest in it, it can be incredibly powerful to use everyone's collective energy. And it's also useful if you have partners that are not interested in witchcraft per se, they're not interested in learning to practice it themselves, but they want to get involved. You as a practitioner can draw on everyone's energy that is connected to you. So you can essentially draw on everyone's energy as well as yourself to charge that working so it's great if you have family members or friends or partners who want to get involved in your practice but don't know how you can essentially use them as a power source <laughs> consensually of course you are sharing that power and then at the end of it you would replenish anything that is um lost that they really need and then you can sit and just enjoy that time together afterwards and you can do this with so many things basically any any working that you want to do, you can do in this way if you want someone else's assistance or someone else wants to be involved. And it's a great way of just having that additional connection as well within relationships and as couples, it kind of strengthens that bond and that connection. So it's not specifically one ritual per se or like one spell, but it's a technique that you can use that is great, especially for couples. Okay, I'm here somewhere. My trousers are still squeaking on the chair. <laughs> Note to self, don't wear these trousers again. <laughs> Not on a live stream anyway, because the squeaking just sounds like I'm sitting on a whoopee cushion and it's really awkward. Um, ba -ba -da -ba -ba -da. Oh, here we go. So I'm finding it difficult lately to do any spells because someone is always home and I don't have easy access to finding a place to be alone. I feel like I'm letting the craft and my deity down. Do them inside. Um, there's one book I've seen it in. I'm not sure I'm convinced on how much I like the book. I'll have to give it another read, but it is called Witchcraft Theory and Practice. And within that book, at least I think it was that book, do not hold me to it because I'm, I'm remembering this from like 2000 and something. And um, within that was discussed creating your own working space inside. So it, it's like an inner temple, an inner sacred space. You are performing all of your workings inside your own space that you have created and I have used that technique since I read that book and you can work with deities in there you can work with your spirits and servitors in there you can do spells and rituals that are complicated that need a lot of space because you are doing that energy work in the physical world but you are mentally doing them in an inner world does that make sense so you can still direct energy out you can still charge objects. It's just that the ritual aspect of that work is happening up here instead of happening out here. And it's a way of doing it if you are feeling limited in your space. And it means that you can actually do, say, larger workings. And if you need to, you can do this in the astral as well. So that's, that's using an astral temple rather than an inner temple. 
And with astral work, you can also work with other members of the community as well. If you have a coven or a group that you would like to um, to work with and you aren't able to meet up, a lot of covens do this. They will meet in the astral and do their spells and rituals there. So they're still manifesting and still working together, even if they live hundreds of miles away from one another. What, what effect do you think the AI, AI has and will have on a person's craft? So, hmm. I am a forewarning, not a fan of AI, um, mostly because people are getting far too comfortable with stealing other people's work. So I know I did a video once on AI, never done one since because I have since been educated. And I, yeah, it's a, it's a slippery slope because the problem is, is that what people are doing is they are learning via AI. And there's two problems for this. One is that AI can't tell the difference between real witchcraft and fake nonsense witchcraft from books, TV shows, movies, fan fictions, all that kind of stuff. The second is that they are learning work from stolen information. So it's it's any ebook, any website, any blog is being used to fuel AI's information. And the problem with that is that you are taking the work of legitimate practitioners. I'm not saying that the people who are learning aren't legitimate practitioners, but AI is not a legitimate practitioner. And they are stealing that work, not paying practitioners for the time and effort and sometimes decades of work they've put into creating a book. And then people are learning from it. And that is an issue in that you are not supporting the magical community. Immediately people seem to have, in the modern day, people seem to have less respect for people within the community. It's that, well, I want information and I want it free, so therefore the rest of the community doesn't matter. And I think that in itself is gonna have a massive impact on the magical community. Because people today don't have the same issues in especially non-Bible Belt areas of North America and in the UK. They don't have the same issues as they did even at the start of my practice. And I have not been practicing for a massive amount of time. You know, I'm nearly two decades in and I've seen a massive shift. And there are many, many practitioners who've seen so many shifts that they remember when the Witchcraft Act was repealed in the UK. That's a massive deal. You know, when they started practicing, witchcraft was illegal. And now they can openly practice and it's popular, it's trendy. But the lack of respect on members of the magical community, I think is gonna become an issue because the community is a community for a reason. People learn from other people. You can work together with other members of the community. And I do wonder if slowly group work is going to start disappearing because people no longer need to learn from other people. A robot can do that for them. People no longer need to go to group events or coven scenarios because they no longer want that connection with other community members. I do wonder if it's kind of, it's not the beginning of the end of group work, but I do think there's definitely going to be shifts in how people are practicing and how people are starting out on their journey and whether people are actually going to start prioritizing learning from stolen information by AI, that is what it is, let's face it, rather than supporting members of the community that they want to become a part of. And I think that's that's a big, a big issue. Um, Cause writing takes a long time, a very, very long time. It is not quick. And, and that I think that, that does need to be supported. We need to still be supporting our witchy authors and our creators of products and not just buying from Shein and Timu and all of these places that are not really ethical and probably are far less ethical than we even realize right now. Don't sue me, that is just me speculating and nothing more. But you know, it's, it's a tricky one, it's a fine line and I think it could go bad, <laughs> honestly. <laughs> But alas, let's get on to happier things, shall we? Um, okay, I'm trying to figure out where I was. I was here somewhere. Uh, is taking revenge with the help of black magic bad? I mean, the term black and white magic is really, really outdated right now. And it, I mean, context. 
Context is really, really important. Practice is really important. Tradition is really, really important. And when it comes to baneful magic, that is, t revenge does fall under baneful magic if it is in the intention to cause someone harm. That is baneful, malicious magic. And revenge doesn't have to be like that. It doesn't have to be revenge. Sometimes it can just be sending energy back where it came from. Sometimes it can be just being the bigger person. And that's not to say that one is better than the other or should be done over the other. I'm not the person to shame you for doing any kind of magic because my path is twofold. I am fine if absolutely necessary, emphasis on absolutely necessary, to do magic that would be by modern communities be considered baneful magic but i will only do that if that is my last resort and i follow a more gray path i don't think that black and white as mentioned earlier that black and white thinking i don't think it's necessarily good and i think it's even harder to actually categorize things as strictly good or bad i think that everything is somewhere on that sliding scale of good or bad and it's going to depend on how comfortable you feel with it, your tradition, your religion, your technique, why you're doing it, what you're planning on doing. It's it's just too variable for there to be one singular answer. I don't know where I am. What are your recommendations on starting hearth and home magic? I... Personally, would recommend learning from she who created said tradition, um, Anna Franklin. So Anna Franklin is the author of Hearth Witch. Um, as far as I know, having read the book and many others that are similar, she is the creator of the term Hearth Witch. I absolutely love her work. She's phenomenal. And she has a book called Hearth Witch. And I would recommend you read it. She's got lots of books, including books on like different aspects of the Hearth Witch tradition. And I think it's a really, really good read. And if anyone's interested in Hearth Witchcraft, I would recommend checking her work out. She's phenomenally good as an author. I really want to meet her. I've met her once at um, Pagan Pride. Um, one of the pagan prides or was it witch fest um, maybe it was witch fest um, in like 2015 or something like that and I've not been able to see her again since but that would be amazing because she's so cool and uh, <laughs> yeah I definitely recommend um, yeah Anna Franklin let's see if I can find the book um... yeah so it's just called hearth witch it has the author in an illustrated form with red hair and a green um, robe with a cauldron. And it's that one, that is really, really good. It's on my um, repeat read list. Like it's one of the ones that I need to read again this year. And so last time I read it, I loved it. We'll have to see if I still enjoy it, but I'm sure I will. Did you get any new Dixie rings since your last video on witchy jewelry? I'm a huge fan of them and would love to see your collection. I actually haven't. I have got a few rings from Oh my goodness, Regal Rose. I'll have to, if, if anyone wants me to, I will happily do a new kind of witchy jewelry, how I use them in my magic kind of video. Um, but yeah, Regal Rose is where I'm getting them from right now, mostly because I, I disappointed myself. I was gonna get a, re a ring from um, Shop Dixie. It was one of Harmony Nice's collection, I think. It was the Green Man ring and I, I should have got it, they had one left and I didn't have the money to get it, I'm so sad. And uh, then I've never been able to find them anywhere ever again, so I'm sad. So now I, I tend to lean more towards Regal Rose right now, mostly because the style of the Shop Dixie rings are not for me right now, but they'll probably come out with something that's absolutely gorgeous in the future. Right. Where was I? I don't know where I was. I'm losing track of them. Oh, okay, so I've got a few thank yous to give. So thank you so much to Darkly Made, thank you very much, and also to Bridge Unknown. Thank you so much, I'm really glad that you enjoy the streams. Oh, it jumped, it jumped. <sighs> scroll, 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 scroll. <laughs> I've actually not had it jump that bad today, which is kind of amazing. This is like shocker for me. It usually jumps so much more. 
だだだだだだだだだだだだだだ Ooh, any new thoughts on how witchcraft connects with karma, Akashic records, and trauma? Honestly, I don't have that many thoughts on it, mostly because my tradition doesn't really include karma. It's something that is not seen particularly much in British folk magic, and so I, I don't really have great thoughts on it. And honestly, the Akashic records I've never deeply looked into. It's definitely something I need to dive into because I'm hearing a lot about it on social media. And I'm like, I keep hearing about this. What I need, I need to know more. So it's on my to, to understand more of list in 2024. I don't, does anyone else have that? I have like these burning questions where I'm like, I'm going to write it down and then I'm going to research it next year. And so that's on my list, along with like rereading like my entire collection, which let's face it, is not going to happen in one year, but I'm going to try. <laughs> I'm going to really try. Any thoughts on past lives or previous soulmates trying to communicate with their significant other currently through divination? Interesting. That's kind of confusing to me because... We, um, we can experience past lives as in like if we do especially hypnotherapy is used a lot like hypnosis is used a lot to get deep enough to figure out past lives and we might experience kind of snippets of memory from past lives but i've never really known of anyone communicating via divination to their past self because they're just communicating with themselves and then same with soulmates, because like if it was a soulmate in a past life and they have also passed over, then they would be someone else. If if we're working on the logic of like past lives being reincarnation and all that stuff. I'm, con I'm, I'm honestly confused by this concept, but it's a very interesting one. I've not heard anything about it though. So whether I need to do more research on this, perhaps, I don't know, but it's a very interesting concept. I'm just confused by it. It's the kind of concept that makes my brain hurt. It makes me go like, hmm, I think I need to like research deeper in this. Right. Oh my goodness, I did not see this. Thank you so, so much to Star Search Reject. Thank you so much. And thank you so much for all your continued support because I always see your adorable smiling face. There's always smiling faces that I recognize in the comment section and in the chat and everything. And it, honestly, it brightens my day. So thank you so much. I hope you have an amazing Yule and an amazing solstice. We really are counting down to it now, aren't we? Like it's getting, it's getting closer. I'm really excited. It's gonna be cloudy though. And I know it's gonna be cloudy and I'm still gonna be excited. But then when I wake up in the morning and I, I click on the live stream and it's going to be really disappointing. <laughs> it's okay though. Maybe miraculously it might not be cloudy. Who knows? Da, 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 da. How do you talk to gods and goddesses? I have a hard time reaching out to them. How do I know if they're tricksters and how do I get rid of them? I ah, see there's that thing again. Social media has got an obsession with trickster spirits. Most people are not interesting enough to warrant the attention of trickster spirits is the sad, honest reality of it. I'm not interesting enough. And I'm sure that most other people aren't in interesting enough as well. Um, so when it comes to how I, how I communicate specifically would be <sighs> Claire, I forget what it's called. There's obviously like Claire Sentience. Yeah, I think it's Claire Sentience. Claire, it's, it's the knowing. <laughs> I should know this off the top of my head. I don't remember everything. See, this is evidence. I don't remember everything. Um, I have always very strongly had a knowing. And that knowing is s s typically pretty accurate when it comes to these things. And so I will often communicate through that. It's almost like this, same with spirits, deities, servitors, anything like that, comes through this like knowing in my head of like, this is what is being said. And I just kind of intrinsically know it's really hard. If you've, if you've ever experienced it yourself, please let me know if you can describe it any better. But I don't know how to describe it in that it's like having a conversation with yourself in your head, but you know that it's not yourself because your own thoughts are going, like I, I narrate to myself 24 seven. I never shut up, ever. <laughs> and I'll just be narrating to myself. And then all of a sudden this additional kind of conversation will kind of just overlay over the top. So I'll have like two conversations going at the same time. So it's just kind of knowing of the conversation rather than hearing it with my own ears. The other way of doing it is through meditation, dreams, and also divination, which are really useful, especially divination is great if you are just getting started and you kind of, 
you are doubting your own abilities, you can't remember your dreams that well, you're not that comfortable with meditation, divination is a great way of doing it where you essentially are requesting the deity in question to let you know when to stop. And when that happens, you'll know which cards to draw and it will give you additional information that way, which can help with communication. So hopefully that helps. When it comes to tricks to spirits, more often than not, it won't be a tricks to spirit. And if you've got your suitable protections up, if you've got home protections up, if you've got your personal protections up, if you are very aware also of the deity that you are working with, the kind of ways that they are going to act, the kind of things they're going to ask for, how they're going to communicate with you, that's all going to influence how easy or difficult it is to be tricked. So keep yourself informed and keep yourself aware and keep yourself protected. And they're like the easiest ways of doing it. And also TikTok is scaring the crap out of people with trickster spirits. And yes, while trickster spirits do exist, as mentioned earlier, and in some places they are probably far more prevalent than they are in others. In my experience here, and a lot of my friends, have not experienced tricks of spirits in the way that social media would have you believe. And while yes, they occur probably not as frequently as people are potentially making out. <laughs> oh, it's getting to that time where I'm starting to go a little off the rails. It's fine, it's fine. Uh, do you have any tips for connecting to the Holy King and to any particular and any particular workings recommended? I don't personally work with the Wiccan celebrations in the way that Wiccan practitioners may well work with them. For me, I connect with the deeper meaning behind the celebration, so these seasonal shifts and changes. So the Holy is a very sacred evergreen at this time of year and actually all evergreens are really significant at this time of year so I can only imagine that that would also apply if you were to work directly with the holly king energy and in which case you might want to start forming a connection with the holly tree the holly plant however you want to refer to it as so that you can form a deeper connection with the spirit of that plant and perhaps also make a deeper connection with all of the characters that are associated with them. So for me, it's all about working with the plants associated with the myths rather than the myths over the plants. So if it's the Oak King, for instance, I would make a connection with oak trees and so on and so forth. So that's personally what I would do. It's not gonna work for everyone depending on where you are and whether you have access to holly trees or Plant. I see people referring to it as different things. I always refer to it as a holly tree or a holly bush, but I don't know. Um, so yeah, that's how I would do it. Might not apply to everyone. <laughs> Does anyone know what kind of spirit or fae presents itself as an eight foot tall humanoid built like a viking, but made of all tree bark with no face? Ooh, interesting. I immediately, as other people have gone in the chat, would go either we are looking at a nature spirit. I'm doubting elemental simply because elementals rarely bother themselves with people the same way as other spirits do. So we're looking at something that could be a nature spirit possibly quite likely to be a nature spirit actually or we're looking at something that may well be fey and context is going to really matter as it always does context always matters when it comes to witchcraft and surrounding traditions so if we are looking at if we're looking at a nature spirit they usually interact with you when something has occurred so whether a plant has been dug up a tree has been disturbed when a park or natural location is going to be harmed or destroyed, when you or your family or on the property have removed a plant of significance, these things are all likely to occur in the precursor to this kind of spirit interaction. So if anything like that has been happening or has happened, it may well that they have either come for assistance when it comes to um, natural environments being destroyed and don't get me wrong nature spirits are incredibly powerful they do not need our help but when humans are hell-bent on literally ripping out a tree or a park it's usually only other humans that will get them to stop and so 
it may well be that that kind of environment is occurring um, and then aid is being requested or it may be that a nature spirit has been disturbed because a plant has been taken out especially if they look the way that it has been described would be a tree of some kind and I'm wondering if you can gain maybe a little bit more insight into the bark of that tree because if they are covered in bark that seems like a very very specific way of appearing to you that's a very purposeful way of appearing to you so you're looking at something that is probably old something that is probably very large and something that likely has the bark that matches what the nature spirit is sharing with you and so that could give you some indication there we could also be looking at a fae because fae much unlike popular belief are not cute little small things with wings they, they can be absolutely ginormous. They can be giants in size. And so this wouldn't surprise me if it was a fae. Usually though, the fae encounters tend to have something else to them. So they often come with a, a ringing of bells is a really common one, or a change in smell is often a really common one as well. The air often becomes kind of staticky, feels very different. So it's as with all spirit encounters, it's gonna very much depend on context, but I'm leaning perhaps more towards nature spirit rather than fey or elemental or anything like that, but it's all up for debate, honestly. Okay. Where was I? Oh my goodness, I did not see this. Thank you so much to Eddie. Thank you so much. I need to get better at seeing when they come up on the screen. There should be, there's meant to be like a notification that goes ding <laughs> when it happens. And it isn't doing it and it hasn't done it since I set it up. And that's really a sign I need to go in and fix it um, so that I can actually hear it when it happens. That would be really great. Um, Is it strange if a spirit I work with says I'm their descendant? No, honestly, not really because if anything, you are more likely going to have easy communication with ancestors than you would be with a random spirit if you are kind of just getting started and stuff, and then it will amplify from there. So it's something perhaps to work into. Yeah, work into, work up to. That's what I was after, work up to. I'm trying to figure out more about them, see if they can give any more information so you can look at records, but it really wouldn't surprise me. Is there a type of witchcraft that is similar to the Wiccan religion? I believe in a god and a goddess and I'm earth-centered in my practice as well as crafting, but I don't subscribe to the Wiccan read. Um, note here, the Wiccan read was added in the 19, late 1970s, early 1980s, I believe. It was in a series of poems, I think by Doreen Valiente. I might be wrong on that, but it's, it's a later addition to the Wiccan tradition, which is based off pre-existing witchcraft practices. So, Honestly, you're just looking at maybe a blended tradition there because there's so many Wiccans who don't follow the Wiccan read because the Wiccan read is a new er, new er edition. And um, there's Wiccans who practice today who are devout Wiccans in their practice and who don't follow the Wiccan read because they follow a tradition that is pre the edition of the Wiccan read. Um, just something to look into. It's a fascinating history, the entire thing. I'll have to check out actually which... Um, Uh, whether it was Doreen Valiente. Yes, um, Wiccan Read. Uh, I don't really trust this website, but anyway. Um, one of the most quoted laws of Wicca is a variation on the Wiccan Read and appeared in the writings of Gerald Gardner and is still used by many practitioners today, but a bit more similar can be found within the work of Alistair Crowley. Blah, 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 blah. One version of the Wiccan Read was made famous by Doreen Valiente in the early 60s and in 1974, a lengthier version by Lady Gwen Thompson. That's what I was after. Lady Gwen Thompson was published in the Green Egg Pagan magazine and then it essentially just became more popular from there. So that was, for anyone who wants to learn more, that's on the Learn Religions section. Uh, the Learn Religions website under the page, The Wiccan Read. Um, but that's what I was after. Lady Gwen Thompson, she published kind of this extended version and then it popularized The Wiccan Read. And before that point, while people maybe had tenets that they were learning and teaching and practicing by, it isn't something that, necessarily had this like hard and fast 
rule that is perceived by many practitioners today. So just bear that in mind with it because you may well be following an, a kind of an eclectic, solitary, non-initiatory style of Wicca. It just is based on kind of one of the earlier forms of it and just not the form with the Wiccan read included. Okay. I apologize if you hate random noises. It is. <laughs> It is the only way I can stay focused, is if I like I'm doing other things. Um, what is the name of the Spirit Communication audiobook? So that is um, Raymond Buckland's in... let me check. <laughs> so I can get it right. It is called Raymond Communications... or Buckland's Book of Spirit Communication, and it is bright red, <laughs> if that helps. Um, and the narrator is phenomenal. Absolutely amazing. Abs I want to every book that I read to be read to me by him, but it won't happen because he's barely done any other books, but <laughs> yeah, he's really, really good. Okay, let's have a look. Have there been any times that you feel like you can't practice your craft? I thought by moving out of my parents, I would do my practice more often, but it feels the same living in an apartment. Oh, there's been so many times. Whether it is health issues, whether it is stress, whether it is other people being present in my space, whether it was my university course, whether it was just feeling not grounded in my magical practice, there's so many reasons. And the reality is, is that while magical practice might come automatically to us, like the connection to the natural world, the sensing of energy, the seeing of spirits, these things might come really naturally to some people, not all. The act of practicing is actually something that we have to focus on doing. We have to dedicate time to it. We have to set aside energy to be able to practice it. And that's not something that we feel like we're able to do all of the time. And I think that's the thing, these, the lifestyle part of the craft is very intrinsic to a lot of us. It's like a default setting. The active practice of the craft is something a lot of people have a lot of difficulty with, and it's not because they don't want to, it's often because they don't have the energy for it. They maybe are in too much pain or discomfort to be able to, maybe they don't have the mobility for it, or the time, or the space, or the finances, if they want additional items for their workings. You don't need that, of course, but if they would like to, they aren't able to access that. And there's always things that are gonna come up which are gonna limit how much we can practice. And that's why I always try my best to make it clear that all of these people you see on social media that are like, this is a day in my life of practicing witchcraft and they do like 15 spells, that's not normal. That's not saying it's wrong, it's just that full-blown rituals, not just day-to-day -day small magical activities, but like full-blown ceremonial rituals, that is not something that most people are gonna have the time to do every single day. And even sitting down and doing a spell that takes 30 to 40 minutes, most people aren't able to do that four, five times a day. Most people are lucky if they have the time to do that once. And so I do think it's really important to not kind of put too much of your, your faith in your own magical practice on social media or on what other people are doing because everyone is going to be so different in the restrictions on their time, on their energy, on their space as well, that don't compare yourself to anyone else. You practice when you can and when you can set time aside for it and you shouldn't be made to feel guilty if you don't have the time, the resources, the ability to do it every day, every week, hell, even every month. Like everyone is going to be very very different in that. And don't get me wrong, I love social media, sometimes. <laughs> it definitely does give unrealistic expectations on magical practitioners and it can make people feel really shitty about how often they practice or even what their practice looks like, which I think we all, even I need to remember, um, isn't gonna be pretty all of the time. It doesn't have to be pretty, it doesn't have to be often, it just has to be useful to you. And that is the most important thing, is the usefulness to you. I. What's your opinion on if witches had a flag for the community? I've never really thought about it. I don't really know. I mean, it could be 
useful. It could also be a target. <laughs> I say that only because of what happened in Witchfest Croydon. If you know, you know, I didn't go, luckily. I was going to and I didn't, and I'm kind of glad I didn't. But unfortunately, there are still a lot of people who are very opposed to witchcraft and actively seek out witchcraft events, shows, celebrations to harass and in some case purposefully attempt to incite harm. And so I think it's perhaps a really good way for some people if you feel inclined to do so to share your community and if you feel comfortable doing that. But I do think it would need to be used with caution, especially in some places where that can cause really negative, potentially harmful reactions with other people. So I don't know. I mean, I, I always think flags are pretty. I mean, I love, I love pride flags, right? Just all of them. I just, <laughs> I love all the colors. And I just, I love getting to see like pride flags and all, every different variety out there. I just think they're so pretty. So I feel like I'd kind of be drawn to it in the same way, but just for a different reason. So where was I? I was. How's that candle going, Carl? I'm wondering if it's totally burned out. You know what? It's actually not. It's actually fine. Um, I'm very, I'm very proud of it. It's doing really, really well. They're meant to burn for four hours. So we've got about 25 minutes left. So we'll see how close to the time it will actually, it will actually do. Um, ba -ba -dum. In your experience, if a particular animal keeps appearing in your practice and in daily life, is this an indication of an animal familiar or something else? Mm. So for me, animal familiars don't make any sense. <laughs> it's an unpopular opinion, I know. It's just my own experience. People can do and feel and believe whatever it is that they want to, that's fine. But for me, a familiar plays a very, very specific role in that they are a spirit that is able to aid us in our spells and rituals and assist us in traversing the spiritual plane to gain energy, information, insight and to assist in spells and rituals spiritually while we work physically and energetically. To me, especially when it comes to people's pets, they don't fulfil that role. To me. They are, however, a useful, magical animal companion. And I think that that's the distinction that I draw between the two. If other people don't, that's completely fine as well. For me, a magical animal companion would be an animal that is in your space, maybe a pet that really likes being around you, specifically wants to be around you during spells and rituals, and in many cases can help calm the energy of that space, maybe can help you feel more comfortable, more protected, might even assist you in divination, who knows? I know a lot of cats really enjoy like picking tarot cards and stuff. And they have a significant role to play for a lot of people. And so this could be, if it isn't something like a pet that likes to be around you, it could be something like a magical animal companion. For me, that kind of connection is not a animal familiar because to me that it, they don't align with the requirements of a familiar within my experience and practice. When you've got an animal that you are seeing in your day-to-day -day life, like you're suddenly seeing foxes more often than usual, you might find that that is appearing for other reasons, it could be a symbolic reason, it could simply be a natural reason, it might be a deity or a spirit that is coming through to you, but they might also present themselves in astral and in dreams and in trance and journeying as a spirit familiar in animal form. Different from an animal familiar that is of like a pet or an animal. Instead, it is a comfortable form for a spirit to take to make you feel at ease. If anyone has seen uh, the Chilling Adventures of Sabrina, that is a great physical representation of what I mean, where she calls out for a spirit to become her familiar and the spirit takes on a comfortable form of a black cat because its original form is not comfortable to look at. Same can kind of apply in that regard. So it, it can mean so many different things depending on context. Context, it's come up so much today. Um, but yeah, that is just kind of a few um, options out there. How do you know for sure if a spirit is good or bad? Can't they just lie? They can. And that is why vibes, <laughs> vibes are very important. And by that I mean 
other things that are happening around. So if you have um, horrible smells in your home, whether that is the smell of like rotting or whether it's the smell of sulfur or something rancid and chemically and just not very nice, that is a sign that as long as there's no other cause, that there is something not quite right about that spirit, especially if the smell comes just before a spirit encounter and then leaves just after. If you have no smell at all, that is a fairly good sign. If you have a very sweet, sickly smell, that could be a sign of a, a fair folk. If you have like a very planty smell, that could be nature spirits. These kind of things are really important. If you have animals, also really useful. Animals that start reacting very, very distressed or at least uncomfortable when you have some kind of spirit interaction is a sign that that spirit might not be good. They might not be super nice or friendly, no matter what it is they're actually saying or doing. They might actually be portraying themselves differently than they actually are. So that's also a really good sign. Generally speaking, you will have kind of a gut feeling about it. That's what I typically go off. So if everything being said seems a little too good to be true, it's generally because it is. And sometimes, I mean, I'm sure people will experience this even with humans, is you will meet someone and they will be sickeningly sweet. They'll be the nicest person on earth, nice as pie. And your gut feeling goes, I really don't want to talk to them again. And it's nothing that they said. It's nothing that they did. It's just this gut feeling of, oh, this doesn't feel quite right. That same feeling can also apply when it comes to spirit work as well. Good way of getting more definitive answers if you're working with your guides, if you're working with your ancestors, then you can ask them and they will be able to give you some insight as well, which can be a really good kind of like cherry on top to figure out how a spirit is behaving and whether it aligns or not. But generally speaking, smell how other beings, spirits, animals are interacting around them and also with like this gut intrinsic feeling is typically what I go off. Oh, thank you so, so much. Very happy Mondays. That's a really nice name. Thank you so much. So where was I? I'm, I'm here. Here we go. Just curious, are the deities you work with from different pantheons? So Bridget is seen in many different guises, um, probably most famously as Saint Bridget, but I work with her as Bridget from um, kind of Irish Celtic tradition, depends on what you're reading and whatnot. I work with Ceridwen from Welsh tradition, who came through to me whilst I was in Wales actually, which I thought was really cool. And then Kerunos, who honestly, doesn't have that much information. Where was the cauldron found? I think, um, let's have a look. So Kerunos is a Celtic and Gallo-Roman um, deity. And the cauldron I was thinking of is the um, Gundenstrup cauldron. I'm definitely saying that wrong, which is currently in display in Copenhagen. Um, but yeah, most of them are British Isles focused. And that just happens to be how everyone um, came through to me. I was just very lucky that uh, they kind of came through in the regions that were kind of significant to them, which I think is really, really nice. So, I had this song in my head last time as well, and I'm not sure why. Can you honor both the Morrigan and Hecate at the same time? I feel drawn to both. You can have multiple deities at once and connect with different deities. Whether you would want to honor them at the same time, as in like give offerings, honor them at the same time, I personally wouldn't. I would split it into two different events so that you can really give time to each individual but you can be working with more than one deity at a time. Some people will follow whole pantheons, 12, 16, 24, 36 different deities at a time. Other people will have just a few. Some will just have one. It very much varies. And you can also have none for anyone who's wondering. You can have no deities. It's not a requirement. It's just something you can add if, if you would like to. Right. I'm 
kind of lost again. Where was I? How do you know if a god or goddess wants to contact you? I've seen a lot of Hecate stuff around me, mostly online, unrelated to what I watch and do. I don't want to assume because it's online. So if we're talking about things like Instagram, TikTok, even if you pause or like stay on a, on like a TikTok video or a reel for more than a few seconds, more than just the time it takes for you to scroll past it, the algorithm is going to show you more and more and more. So even if you're not sitting and watching it all the way through, even if a picture about Hecate comes on a screen just for a few seconds and you scroll past, if you stay on it for just slightly too long, it will throw it into the algorithm. So I, maybe I'm cynical, personally, I completely throw out the window um, anything on social media, unless it is also backed up by things I'm experiencing in my own life, because the algorithm is so focused on time. Even the slightest amount of time spent on something, it will then show you more and more and more, because time is what it wants from you more than anything else, and data. Have you seen TikTok's terms and conditions? And data. But, um, when it comes to things in, like, the real world, i.e. not on social media, you're looking at dreams uh, with figures, with symbols, signs, animals that are related to said deities. We're looking at things coming through in readings, things coming through in meditations, animals crossing our paths in day-to-day -day life that are unusual for the time of year. I think it's important to emphasize that because around September, I always get people asking about spider goddesses. And the reality is it's just that spiders are coming inside for the winter. So it has to be, ideally animals that you would not normally see at that time of year or in the way that it is being seen. And all of that can then bolster what it is that you are experiencing on social media. I personally wouldn't use social media as the primary sign focus simply because of how all of the algorithms work. I'm, I'm constantly lost right now, <laughs> is what I'm discovering. Um, I'm here somewhere. I find I'm constantly, when I get to like the bottom of the stream and it's like, you get into like four hours in, I'm like going, I can't figure out where I am anymore. I think I've been staring at the screen for too long. Two. Could I use a violin for spells? I mean, yeah, music is such an intrinsic part of so many people's magical practice. You definitely can do that. And actually some people find that certain notes is really, really good to like even play and record so you can play back again. So you can even make your own kind of repetitive repeating piece of music that you can overlay if you wanted to. So then you can repeatedly put it on for like entering into trance and things like that. That could be a cool way of incorporating your own talents into your magical practice. Right. Do, 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 do. Do you have any recommendations for some somber rituals for you all? What's going on in the world has made this season less joyful for me. Really, the, the rituals are so unique. I mean, I make everything for purpose. So it could be releasing harm, it could be protection workings, it could be healing spells for people who need it. It could be comfort workings for the people who are going through real difficulties right now. There's so many varieties. I mean, when, with the winter solstice, you've got the return of the sun. So you've got that new hope, new beginnings, growth, development, all these kind of things that you can really draw on the energy of, which could be useful depending on your style of practice and what you fancy doing. If you don't have coloured candles, how can a plane represent, say, wealth or prosperity? Using sigils with candles? Um, well... White is typically used, and white is used for multiple reasons. Firstly, it's really, really easy to get hold of. Most places do white candles. Um, but on top of that, it is also the colour that holds all colours in light, which is why a lot of people will use it. Some people will do it the other way round. So light is all colours, black is the absence of light. 
Whereas in paint, white is the absence of colour and black is the presence of all colours. So people do it differently depending on how they think about it. But it is just neutral. The candle is simply there as a representation of your goals. And so if your goals are for wealth, you can use a white candle or you can use a green, a gold, whatever other colour candle you want because it is your intention and your energy that is powering that working, not the candle. The candle is a focal point and that's why we can use our magic and we can manifest results without any objects because they are simply a focus for our magic rather than the magic itself. And so you can use a candle, charge it with a specific intention of what it is that you want to manifest. You can dress it with oils of a particular intention. You can use herbs of a particular intention to really strengthen it. You can create a sigil for a particular intention and then carve it into the candle. I use an awl, A-W-L. It's like a leather carving tool, like a puncture tool. You can also use pins, anything that's sharp, just be safe with it and carve it in that way. And it's a way of avoiding um, having to get really expensive candles because some candles, gold and silver specifically, are not possible to do as a full colour candle. I like using full colour candles. We make full colour candles because I like using them. Um, so usually when you go to like cheaper witchcraft stores, you'll find dipped coloured candles. So they are a white candle with a coloured coating on them. But when you carve into them, it's just white underneath. And I always think that's tremendously disappointing. So instead, um, I use just full colour candles. They're not always that acceptable. I'm lucky. Not acceptable? Not that accessible. I'm lucky because we make them. I can just make candles as I need them. Um, but not everyone does. So you can completely adapt a plain white or a plain black candle with different things. Oils, herbs, sigils, symbols, writing, petitions, imagery that you stick underneath it, sounds that you play, things that you say, you know, mantras, words, phrases, poems, pieces of music, all this stuff. I think I repeated myself like 12 times in that. But anyway, all of that can then add into that intention to manifest more successfully. Oh my goodness. Thank you so, so much, Relic of Ages. Thank you so much. I'm amazed by your continued support. It is absolutely phenomenal. I cannot truly express how, I don't know, how amazing it is to have such amazing support. So thank you so, so much. Happy Yule Hearth. Happy Yule to you too. Have you heard of the Egyptian goat or ram-headed god? I am going to butcher that name. Knu? 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 I definitely am butchering that. I haven't been able to find anything useful as his appearance has started popping up in my dreams without warrant. Interesting. I feel like I definitely spelled that wrong. I'm saving that so I can do more research because I have a friend who works more with this side of magic than I do. And so... I think I, I would have to do some more research on it. But yeah, interesting. Definitely something to look more into, obviously, as you're trying to. Um, yeah, I'm afraid I don't have any information off the top of my head, which I'm really sorry about, because I'd love to be able to help right now. And I don't think I'm going to be able to, but I'm definitely going to have to keep an eye out for some more information. And um, if I find anything, I can always send it over to you and uh, see if we can figure something out. But yeah, besides the basic stuff that's coming up here, which I'm 99.999% .99 certain you've already looked at, um, anyone who's interested in this, this is from the Botanica website, and um, I'm going to get the name wrong. Knum. Knum? Knum. I, that's definitely wrong. Is an Egyptian god of fertility associated with water and procreation. He was worshipped, worshipped in the first dynasty around... Uh, 2,925 to 2,775 BCE into the early centuries CE, represented as a ram with horizontal twisting horns or a man with a ram's head, believed to have created humankind from clay like a potter. Um, there's a scene that has him depicting the world on a potter's wheel. Yeah, using a potter's wheel depicted in later times. That's really interesting. Oh, I'm gonna, I've not looked into Egyptian anything since I was in like junior school. Um, but yeah, definitely worth checking out, but it seems like a really interesting, so essentially a fertility and water deity is what 
we're looking at right now. If anyone would like to read what I've just read, I'm going to stick it in the chat just so that you've got it there. Um, but yeah, very interesting. I've not looked into anything Egyptian since I was in like year five, which is going to make no sense, I think, for Americans, but that is age nine, <laughs> I think. Oh, I'm definitely going to deep dive into this afterwards. This is exciting. <laughs> okay. Right. Let's have a look. I was... Okay, I just did that one. I've got a hair stuck to my hand. There we go. <laughs> Could you use balloons in spell work? And if so, how? I mean, I suppose there's always ways that you can. I do think it's important to remember that balloons are incredibly bad for the environment, so just be incredibly cautious in that regard. They could be used to represent the air element, I suppose, in like um, ceremony and ritual, but they are obviously largely plastic and need to be disposed of correctly, otherwise they end up really harming wildlife and farm animals especially cows cows are really cows and horses so just please be really careful if you are going to use balloons oh we jumped oh no where am i i'm somewhere here i think i'm somewhere here you know what is amazing? I think this is actually the first live stream where I've not lost the chat. Like it's not, it's not been deleted. And all of that talk earlier about having to um, use a Google forms to submit questions. I mean, I probably still will because I'm gonna count this as a fluke given the fact that this is the 58th live stream and the only live stream that hasn't lost questions. So, um, I'm just gonna assume it will do it again, but it's interesting that this is the one stream that it hasn't. Right. Can drinking water be charged or blessed with a sigil? Yeah, you can draw it on the outside of a glass or a bottle and then charge it that way if you wanted to do it like that. That is always an option. Could a spell make you not see physical items or people? Um, yes but not in the way you might be thinking. So they it it's, falls under glamour magic. So glamour magic is workings, well, it, it's a complicated one because a lot of people see glamour magic as just being beauty spells, but it isn't. Glamour magic is far more than that. Glamour magic is altering how other people perceive something, usually the way something looks. So you can glamour yourself to look more a certain way to other people, but that doesn't change how you physically look. Like it's not gonna change your bone structure or your eye color or anything, but it might change how you are perceived to other people. With this also comes the invisibility spell category. Now that's not gonna make you invisible, but it's a form of glamour magic that makes you less noticeable and makes objects less noticeable. So some protection style magic falls under this where you're, you're doing magic to make something less eye-catching, less beautiful, less attractive, less interesting, so someone will steer clear of it or just ignore it. And the same can be done on people. So I know that some people do this when they feel really overwhelmed and uncomfortable and they will cast this kind of magic in a crowded space so that people are less likely to talk to them, which I feel, I get. I would probably do that too if I spent more time around people. Um, so it's just one of those kind of aspects of magic that is really interesting and very much overlooked. You will still, so if someone, if you're standing in a crowd of people and if someone is actively looking for you, it's not really gonna do all that much. It might slow them down, but if they're looking for you, you like if it's someone that you really don't wanna talk to, like if it's an ex and you really don't wanna talk to them, it's not necessarily gonna stop them from being able to talk to you. But if you are simply wanting to kind of blend into the background and just avoid everyday people, then that is something that is really useful. So like if someone was searching for something in your home, it wouldn't stop them from finding it, but they wouldn't just pick it up randomly because it looked interesting. It's that kind of level that we're working with here. Right. Da, ba, 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 ba. Do, 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 do. 
bum 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 bum. Okay. I need to figure out where I was again. I don't know where I was. <laughs> I'm lost. Do you know about palmistry? There's a TikTok trend about the ring of Morgana and people saying in your past life, you were in love with a demon. Yeah, please don't believe anything you see on TikTok. I'm not saying that everything on TikTok is bad. I'm just saying, please take everything with a pinch of salt. Pretty please. Because palmistry is one of those ancient practices that can be incredibly useful. However, every every few years we do see like obsessions with things in palmistry. Like there was, a couple of years ago, there was the thing about if you had like a specific cross on your hand, then it meant that you were like burned as a witch in the past. And I'm like, that doesn't even make any sense. Most witches weren't even burned. And this is kind of the same principle is that, um, yeah, it's unlikely that most people even encounter demons. Like even as a practitioner, <laughs> I have very rarely even in ritual work encountered demons, let alone in just everyday life. This sounds like something from book talk, which I'm not opposed to, I love reading. But um, yeah, I, I suspect this is probably a blend of things. And yeah, I'm, let's have a look. Ring of Morgana. So the, 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 the line, let's have a look what it actually is. So the thing probably exists. Like, the, the actual, like, it probably has a much deeper meaning in um, palmistry than what TikTok is probably making it out to be. <laughs> let's have a look. So this is astrology today, not necessarily saying it's trustworthy, but... Um, what is the ring of Morgana? Morgana Le Fay's ring is an en ensorcelled jewel ring belonging, be wow, language, belong to the founding leader of the malign Morganians, the legendary baneful sorceress Morgana Le Fay herself. That, I feel like that sentence should have been worded way differently. Um, it's one of the many magic items in the 2010 fantasy movie, The Sorcerer's Apprentice. Great movie, by the way, if you've never seen it, it's great. The term Ring of Morgana doesn't have a well-known or established meaning in well widely recognized mythology, folklore, or historical contexts. Um, yeah, yeah. So it's on the middle finger, basically. And usually, according to this, it talks about identity and materialism. Being the tallest finger, the middle finger stands for balance, justice, the law, responsibility, and soul searching. Also the center of the hand, it represents personal, personal identity and those things that are most important to us. In palmistry, the middle finger is known as the Saturn finger and is associated with qualities and characteristics attributed to the planet Saturn. It's situated between the Jupiter finger, the index finger, and the Apollo finger, the ring finger. And it's used to represent discipline, responsibility, ambition, leadership, organization skills, patience, and endurance. It seems, obviously I'm not well versed in any of this. But it definitely seems like this is something that has had long-standing meaning. People have recently had a new obsession with Arthurian legend and book talk and TikTok. And I, it's very, very difficult to pinpoint where things come from, but I have never heard of this before. And it kind of seems like it doesn't have that much solid backing and the likelihood that you're in love with a demon in a past life, most people will never ever encounter one. And so uh, I, I think this is more of a, you know when people say that like most people can't do this thing or that thing and it's actually just like a normal thing that people do and it's used to get like interaction, I wonder if it might be something along those lines. But do let me know, I'm always open to learning new things and if you have any information on this, please let me know because I would genuinely love to learn more about it and see if there is anything real to it. I'm just not... <laughs> I see TikTok trend and I am not convinced that anything is legitimate but um... We will wait and see. <laughs> wait and see. Okay. Let's have a look at what I'm getting here. So, do 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 ba ba da. 
I'm... Where even am I? I'm sure I've gone past that. Anyway, let's go with this. Um, bum, ba, dum. How do you celebrate Yuletide? So I actually have an entire video on it. It is the last video on my channel if you want to check it out. That's everything I'm doing this year to celebrate Yule. Are there any good books to reference about the spirits that are encountered in the other world or when you cross the hedge? Not really, mostly because they vary dramatically depending on where you are. So you've got like dragon spirits are account encountered by some people. You'll also encounter um, sometimes spirits of other practitioners, like astral bodies of other practitioners. You often also find fey and other non-human spirits. And the problem with that is that there are so, so many non-human spirits. So just in my experience, I have encountered giant wolves. I have encountered goblins. Um, I have encountered banshee-like, hag-like, honestly looking a little bit like the girl from the ring kind of beings and it is dramatically different and you find as well that depending on where you are in the world because the astral plane is kind of like an overlay over our own things are different there as well so it's one of those where everyone seems to have experienced different things you'll find that people in similar areas may well experience similar but it's so so varied you might want to look into general books on spirits so like one book that i really enjoy is the encyclopedia of god is it just the encyclopedia of S magical creatures it might be the i'll check <laughs> let's check the element encyclopedia of magical creatures yeah that's it this is the one i've got it's obviously like not super duper amazingly comprehensive but it's pretty it's pretty substantial and in there are lots and lots of magical creatures from around the world and the thing with this is that a lot of folk tales i always do wonder this a lot of folk tales i wonder if it's spirits that are crossing backwards and forwards or people who are astral projecting we see this a lot in like um witch trials and records of that kind of thing and so it makes me wonder if a lot of the spirits that are encountered worldwide are also found in the astral plane as well, which I think could be really interesting and might explain why people experience so, so many different things. Um, so yeah, options, so many options of what you can encounter. Um, unfortunately, some questions I have already answered multiple times. So I'm like, I don't necessarily want to answer again but I also don't want to leave people without questions being answered um because I did this really soon on like soon in I will do this really briefly any tips on getting in touch with my mom after she's passed on my mom and any other ancestors slash loved ones I've lost really briefly as I mentioned in the stream earlier I wouldn't do anything soon after I would make sure that you are taking the appropriate time to grieve, to process, and all of that, because that is something that's really important, it's really healthy, we cannot substitute that for communication, and that is, it's a comfort that a lot of people seek, but it can lead to problems if grief is not being processed fully. And also it takes a long time for spirits to understand how to interact, how to communicate, so they're not always going to know that straight away. So that's something to also bear in mind as well. When the time comes, you might want to leave a space for them. Dumb supper is done at Samhain, or you can leave a drink that was really appreciated. Spray perfume that was really liked. Basically open yourself up to them being present in your space. And then if you would like to, you can ask for them to come through in dreams, which is probably easier for them because your protections are a little bit lower. If they become strong enough, you can ask for answers through knocking, you can commune through meditation, through trance work, as well as through things like spirit boards. But that's obviously if you feel more comfortable in that kind of scenario. So yeah, just make sure that you are processing everything as best as you can first, just to keep yourself safe in everything and just mentally, physically, emotionally on the right level. Like, that sounds not right, but I mean like, just make sure that you are taking care of yourself first. That's what I meant to say. Where was I? I'm here somewhere. 
だだだだだだだだだだだだだだだだだだだだだだだだだだだだだだだだだだだだだだだだだだだだだだだだだだだだだだだだだだだだだだだだだだだだだだだだだだだだだだだだだだだだだだだだだだだだだだだだだだだだだだだだだだだだだだだだ So, yeah. Oh, here we go. I'm the current high priestess for a coven. We're invite only, decision made by vote. Pretty standard, I can accept that. There aren't other options for pagans in our area. How might I support them without involvement of the coven? So, uh, it's it depends on how much interaction you want to have because a lot of... People will have like a moot in their area. Obviously, it depends on where you are. In England, we have a lot of moots. These are like gatherings, are like pubs that pagans and witches can go to and they can talk and learn. And it's kind of community without being in a formal coven environment. And they can always be set up as like a monthly thing where you just meet in a pub and anyone who wants to come and chat can come and chat. And if they don't, then they don't. And it's kind of separate from, but also means that there's like that aspect of community there. There's also mind, body, and spirit shows where you can always go, even do a talk there if that's something you're interested in, so that you can kind of build a little bit of a community with people. But it, it's really difficult, and I mean, interaction on social media is a great way of doing it as well, so that you are present for people who maybe don't feel comfortable being in a space with other people or don't feel open about it yet, but they can have someone to talk to in like a Facebook setting or whatever kind of. Social media setting there is, so you can have that kind of interaction with people without everyone else being involved. But it is kind of tricky because not, not everywhere has these places already in existence. I know you mentioned not honoring two deities at the same time, but what about two ancestors? I have one altar for my past grandmother and great grandmother, grandmother, and give offerings to them both at the same time. Yeah, I'd say that's fine. That the big difference between ancestors and deities. The only exception to this is if you've got two ancestors that you're working with that hated you and that hated each other in life. Not you. That would be weird, wouldn't it? But oh, candle's gone out. I can smell it. Yep, candle's gone out. I need to wrap up soon. That's what that means. So, um, if They really didn't like each other in life. Probably best to work with them separately. Otherwise, they are both ancestors. They are not going to have the same kind of deep-rooted issues, <laughs> issues that some deities might have. I mean, some have really, really not nice mythology, and so to combine two deities together that didn't like each other in any of their stories would be kind of weird, and it wouldn't necessarily be appreciated. The same might apply in your own magical practice. Whereas for ancestors, unless they didn't like each other in life, I think you're going to be pretty okay unless they state otherwise to just work with them together. How do you use black salt in your personal practice? So any workings where I want to remove something or cleanse something away, I will add black salt into it. It's kind of a great cleansing agent for that. To protect space, I will put it in little glass bottles and I put it like over door frames and stuff, as well as around spaces in little containers, dishes, little bottles for added additional protection, especially around bedrooms if you are finding that some additional protection is necessary. Honestly, though, the reason I have so much is because of the my business. I make like this giant bottle, like it's like a giant jar of it. And um, that's why I have so much. So I just kind of dip into it every now and then. You said earlier that you could use shooting stars and comets for charging items. How would I do that? And how do you use the season to charge spells? So it's all about the energy. So as you would draw energy from the earth, if you're doing like grounding practices, you're going to want to be doing that with other things. So any kind of seasonal events, such as the sabbats, will have their own energy to them, and that is the energy that you can draw out of the environment. So you're essentially sticking your tendrils of energy out into the environment, and you're drawing them back in again. This applies to moons, like full moons, new moons, waxing, waning. Um, the season of Samhain, like the energy of Letha, these things are all significant. You would also do this if you want to draw on like the energy of the sun, those kind of things, as well as with cosmic bodies as well. If there's a shooting stars going overhead, a comet passing, you would essentially stick your tendrils of energy out, and you would draw in the energy that you are getting off these events that do give off mass amounts of energy, and then you would channel that into your spells and rituals as you would if you were drawing energy up from the earth. It's just that rather than going down. You're going 
out into the surrounding areas. How do you feel about voodoo? Oh, that jumped massively. Um, I think it's a really beautiful religion and tradition. It is not something that I am particularly looking into or well versed in um, because it is initiatory. But I do think it's really beautiful that such traditions are still going and so deeply rooted as well. I always think it's really interesting to learn about them. Right, where was I? I am somewhere. I am somewhere, somewhere. But I'm not even fucking around with you. Sorry, I'm talking to random people who post troll comments in the comment section. I get them all day, every day. This is what I was talking about, how sometimes, I was talking about this earlier, sometimes you just have to go, yeah, screw you. I don't, I don't do Bible bashers. I, this is the thing, people think I don't like Christians. I love Christians. I think they're, I think they're so sweet. The problem is, is that it's the bad ones that talk the loudest. <laughs> and this applies to every religion and tradition out there. Like, it always happens. I don't care what anyone believes. I don't care. Just don't make me believe it. <laughs> And if you feel like you've got to stand on a soapbox in a random comment section, I think you've got a bit of a problem. That's, that's not normal, that. Find a hobby. <laughs> Read, paint, make art, make beautiful music. I don't care. Just don't sit in my comment section and just post random preachy statements. It's just, I don't get it. I've never understood it. Right, where was I? I should be finishing now because... I, my candle has gone out. That was my timer, and yet I'm still going. To be fair, I am near the bottom though, so it's fine. It's fine. Right, I was. Ooh, okay, let's have a look at this one. So this one, if I can find this. Okay, so here we go. So this one is about, are there any herbs, flowers, magical ingredients sacred to lesbians specifically? I've heard of some for gay men like hyacinth, but not necessarily any for us. Oh, I had, this is what I Googled earlier. So this is from um, Kew Gardens in London. And this is what it says here. So plants are rich in symbolism. They come to represent everything from the language of love to subtle political statements. So it's no surprise that they have become icons of the queer community linked to gay and lesbian love, as well as celebrating transgender identity. As part of Kew's Queer Nature Festival, discover some of the f floral iconography that has been embraced by the LGBTQ plus community. And the top one, Oh, violet. I love violets. If anyone has, hasn't tried violet chocolate, please do. It's amazing. So this says, possibly one of the oldest queer symbols, violets have been linked to lesbian love for over two and a half thousand years, as long as the very origins of the word. The poet Sappho lived on the Greek island of Lesbos in the 6th century BCE and is celebrated as one of the greatest lyric poets of her time. While very little of her poetry has survived to the modern day, the fragments that remain have had an unquestionable impact on the lesbian community. Much of her surviving work contains mentions of garlands of flowers, including violets, as well as roses and crocuses. Depending on the translation, wreaths, garlands and diadems of violets were placed around the slender neck of a girl. Sappho's passionate writing on the delicate beauty of women led to both her name and her nationality becoming intrinsically linked to women who love women, sapphic and lesbian respectively. So that's just one, one tiny section of that. Um, let's have a look, see if anything else is directly or specifically associated. So here we go, lavender. Violets are not the only purple flower linked to the queer community. In the 1930s and 40s, lavender became increasingly associated with gay men and lesbian women. So there's, there's loads and loads on here. I'm gonna put this in the chat so that if anyone's interested, um, you can check it out for yourself. So I love learning. I, the, the power of flowers, like the magic of their symbolism is just amazing. So, and also Kew Gardens is like, an amazing place. So yeah, that's just a few out there. There's probably way, way more, but violets seem to be the most common. And honestly, I don't blame them. Violets are so beautiful <laughs> and they taste really nice. Genuinely chocolate, violet chocolates are amazing. 
Right. Um, what do you think of the Book of Spells by Ella Harrison? I actually haven't read it. I'll have to put it in my to get pile. I've got a few books that people have recommended to me that I need to check out and that is going to have to be one of them. Right. I don't know where I was. Okay. Uh, okay, I'm here. I'm so close to the bottom now. So if anyone has any last minute questions, feel free to put them in the chat. I'm just kind of coming up to the end now, but I always want to try and answer as many as I can. Okay. <laughs> Still going after four hours. Yeah, honestly, I... I just, I get into the swing of them. Before I do a live stream, I'm like, oh my goodness, I don't think I'm gonna be able to do this. In, in Interacting with people for so long, it's so much. But then when I get here, I'm like, I wanna keep going. <laughs> Four hours, that's nothing. Though I should probably, you know, drink some water and eat some food and do human things, like, relax. <laughs> um, right, here we go. Where was I? Do, 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 do. do you use servitors? I do, yes. Um, I really enjoy working with them. They're some of my favorite aspects of the practice to work with just because I think they're so adaptable. How are you? Is life all good? You know what? I'm not, it, it's, uh, it's fine. <laughs> Plodding along as always, but we keep going. Of course we do. We persist. We are like a cockroach. <laughs> nope. Tardigrade. I change my mind. I want to be like a tardigrade because they can survive in a vacuum and that's really cool. <laughs> okay. You can know I'm going a little bit bananas now. So that is the end of the December live stream. We are about to enter into Yule. It is 10 minutes to 12. So in 10 minutes, it is officially the winter solstice. Woo, woo. I'm very excited. I'm watching the live stream in the morning. If any of you are watching it, you can join me on there. I'm very excited. <laughs> So thank you so, so much for joining me. Thank you so, so much everyone who has watched this video, has liked the video. If you haven't already, please give these a like. It really means a lot to me and it helps push my channel to other people who would love to learn more about witchcraft and figure out some more things about it. So let me know if you have any additional comments, if you have any additional questions, whatever it is, and I will be back next week for another video, like a normal video, not a live stream. If anyone is wondering, I do these live streams every single month, so feel free to subscribe and turn your notifications on so that you can figure it out. And I hope you have an amazing Christmas if you celebrate an amazing New Year, if it is your New Year, if not, I hope you just have an amazing December and an amazing winter solstice if that is something that you do celebrate and I will see you in the next video. Oh, what was I gonna say? Oh yeah, thank you so much to everyone who supported by donating as well. That I completely forgot about that, but thank you so, so much. It means a lot to me, it massively helps to keep me going. And thank you to the mods and to everyone who is nice to the mods, because the mod, because the mods, because the, yeah, mods was right. Why did I think that the word mods was wrong? Because the mods keep the channel and the live streams all safe and friendly and just amazing and they do an amazing job so thank you so much guys for helping me with that and yes okay i'm gonna go now before it turns into four hours 30 minutes um so thank you so much and i will see you in the next video okay bye outro <laughs>